Okay, check, check, check. Look at that, 17,000 subscribers. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at A.J. Casson or Casson or or Casson Casson. I, I just was looking up the pronunciation. A.J. Casson, A.J. Casson. Okay. Um, I, I thought it was Casson or Casson, but Casson. It's like very kind of subtle, the ending, right, of the, the name there. I make sure I get it right, okay? So today we're going to be looking at his art. This is the painting we're going to be recreating here, White Pines from 1927, or White Pine from 1927. This is probably his most famous painting, uh, the, the painting that he's most known for. It is a little bit more of a complex painting, or, well, it's not really that much more complex, it's just that there's a lot of detail in there, and depending on how much detail you want to put in there, depends on how long you're going to spend on today's painting. I'm thinking today's painting will take maybe three and a half hours, depending on how much detail I put in there and how much work I put in there. Anyway, well, we're, we're, I'm super excited. That I, I love this artist. We're going to take a look at some of his other paintings as well. There's just a, um, in some ways, he's a lot like Lauren Harris and the kind of very, and, and Emily Carr as well. Uh, the solidity of these forms, as we'll see, is just mm, beautiful. So let's get right to it. Uh, the plan for today is we're going to stain the canvas with a little bit of color, then which, or sorry, we're gonna get the image onto the canvas and then we're gonna stain it with a little bit of color and then we're gonna talk about who AJ Casson is and then we're gonna do underpainting, maybe, mm, I don't know. I don't think we need any underpainting. We're just gonna go right into the background and then the foreground. And as I said, probably about three, uh, three and a half hours from now, we'll get to the side-by-side -side comparison. If you're watching the video after it was recorded, just jump to the timestamps in the below or on the timeline, right? So let's start our class today. Oh, also, if you want to support the channel with a little uh, hitting the like button, the notification button, or the subscribe button, the notification bell, you know, blah, 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 the same, saying the same thing over and over and get my brain gets crossed. Um, as well as I encourage you to join our Facebook group so that you can find out when the, the upcoming episodes are taking place. As well as I encourage you to take a photograph of your artwork, upload it to the Facebook group so that we can celebrate it. There's a I think there was a 630 or so people that have joined this group over the past year and a half, created from your suggestions. So anything else you're, you're interested in suggesting, please leave it in the comments on the Facebook group or here in the chat as well. Um, and uh, if you also want to support the channel with a small donation, you can leave one through PayPal, through the Super Chat, or through the e-transfer interact, e-transfer, etc. through email. You can contact me through the Facebook group or my emails on my website. All those links are down in the description below. Okay, so let's get this image onto the canvas. Now, I have created a free downloadable template, which you can find in the Dropbox link in the description below, and you can print it out on your inkjet printer at home. And... Um, I've just, uh, and I'm going to paint on, this is a canvas board that I ordered off Amazon, and these ones are okay. They're not the best ones. I think they're a little bit thinner, and they seem to kind of, if I sand them too much, because I also put some gesso on top of these canvases, and then sand them again so that they're as smooth as possible. I like painting on a very smooth surface, especially when you get a lot of detail like this. The, the more complex the image, um, uh, 
Uh, but I think that unless you have a much larger canvas, it's easier to paint on a smooth surface, which is why I know many of you often paint on paper, for instance. Nothing wrong with that, right? Um, or panel. Um, one of the things that I've often done throughout my career is painting on panels. Uh, which is just like a basically a piece of wood, right? That you could prime, you could put gesso on it. Um, and it's I, it's fun because sometimes you can leave a little bit of the, the wood texture coming uh, through. Anyway, so what I've just done here is put some carbon transfer paper. Um, or you can use graphite transfer paper, identical, same sort. I mean, they're not identical, but they're basically the same thing. And then I've just uh, slid that under here, obviously make sure that the shiny side is facing down if you do have a shiny side. Sometimes they're double-sided, in which case it doesn't matter. Okay, well, let's bring that back up. So, all this stuff in the clouds, um, I'm just going to keep this pretty simple here. because it's trying to, you know, all these little details, that's, I don't really care about all that. Same thing with the tree. Mostly I'm concerned about just the, the trunk of the tree and the basic kind of structure of where all of these, um, the big clumps of leaves go. So I'm not gonna do every single little line in here. These little branches, same sort of thing. Just a few of that. We'll refer to the original as we do some of that. So again, you can see how quickly I'm doing all this. I'm just getting these shapes in, and once the shapes are in, boom, we're ready to move on. That's some of the ground. Same sort of thing down here. Um, I'm just sort of what I want to do is is anything where there's like a, a you know um, the largest shapes and where they kind of maybe stop and end that way when I'm doing my uh, painting over this I'll be like okay well that shape kind of starts here and ends there and maybe there's a line in the middle to help me but otherwise I think we're fine and remember the purpose of these episodes is not perfection and making a, a duplicate that could stand in for the original in the National Gallery or this paintings in the McMichael collection in Kleinsburg Ontario just uh, an hour north of Toronto or 10 minutes north of Toronto, two hours north of Toronto. Toronto is a big city, so depending on where you are in Toronto, it's uh, closer or further away. And this here. Same sort of thing. Even my outline has a lot of details missing as well, right? And I don't think it's important to get it all in there. Especially because the original is much larger than this painting anyway. So let's see. Lastly, we've got these clouds in the background. That general shape, I think, is good enough. And then my horizon line. I'm just going to make a couple marks there. Let's see. So that's what mine looks like. Um, so just putting those little marks there so that I can use my ruler. just to make sure this is level. So, I'm 
Well, look at that. I was pretty close, pretty close to level right there. Because one of the things that drives me absolutely bonkers is a painting where the horizon line is not level, all right? That's the kind of thing when I'm looking at the painting later on, I'm like, ah, it's not level. Okay, let's just clean up a little bit here. Oh, sorry, keep, I like keeping this nearby. Oops. Okay. So, our next step here, and you know what? I wasn't recording that, so I just want to make sure. Sorry. <laughs> that was loud. Um... Okay, that's good. Let's move on. Okay, so now that we've got our drawing established, let's put a little bit of color onto the canvas and get that process started as well. Now, I'm going to put a little bit of what I call a warm yellow uh, onto the canvas. And I'm going to be using this particular brand at, and the, the tube, the name of the color as they call it, is Azo Yellow Deep. Um, and so these are the, the, the seven tubes of paint that I'm going to be using. I'm not going to be using black because I'm going to be mixing my own, and you can learn how to do that too. Um, of course, every single different... Uh, company's got different names of paint and uh, so which makes of course everything very complicated but here's I'm trying to save you a little bit of uh, struggle figuring it out here's my solutions as to comparable colors from other brands so here's golden and this is much more expensive uh, for much less paint but it is slightly higher quality uh, Liquitex this is their student grade version Windsor and Newton Artist Loft, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color, and but not Museum Color. Museum Color, they add white into the paint, and it's super frustrating because the paint, um, you can't mix a black if you have if you use this paint. And as you know, as I just said, I'm going to make my own black, so I don't want to use something that doesn't uh, allow me to do what I want it to do. Okay, so let's get our paints out. I like to be able to fit everything in one box. I find that so satisfying that I can make any painting, well, virtually any painting in human history from paints that are can fit in one box. And let me just put some paint on my palette here where, while I squeeze paints out here real quick. Um, so six different colors plus white. We'll probably use a bunch of white. So um, when you're painting landscape paintings, often, not all the time, but often you want to use a lot of white because you can mix um, grays and um, to give the illusion of depth, right? Atmosphere in a painting. Ooh, a lot of red. So as you can see here, we've got six different uh, colors plus white and uh, we have two yellows two reds and two blues that's because we're what this is called from a technical point of view is a split primary palette meaning we've split the primaries in half a warm and a cool a warm and a cool a warm and a cool right obviously if you've paid attention to the episodes in the past we've, I've did a whole episode explaining how that whole thing works so now I'm going to take my warm yellow and 
and just put a little bit of water on there. And let's stir it up. Ah, so there's Paula, Pascaline, Kathy joining us, and a bunch of other people who haven't posted the, anything in the chat there. So don't know who you are, but I'm glad you're, you've tuned in and you're watching. Um, now, if you're watching for the first time, you're like, whoa, I've never seen anybody do this before. Why are we putting yellow onto the surface? That is weird. Well, welcome to the channel. Hit the subscribe and the like button uh, before you do anything else. Um, but yes, technically, this is something probably nobody else but me does. Um, because most artists would apply a kind of a rusty red color here to get started. And that rusty red color, um, you know, kind of like an earthy brown, well, brown is generally pretty earthy, but an earthy red color. Uh, or because sometimes in, well, I mean, I've talked about all the different reasons, but another reason is because sometimes artists in the past would paint directly onto wood panels. And so it kind of looks like wood. Um, and the benefit of kind of a, a, a brown is it acts as like your mid value value, not in terms of money, but in terms of light and dark is, is the difference between light and dark, right? The, the value level. And, um, if you have a color that's sort of right in the middle, then you can get darker and you can get lighter. Right, and then you can always have this as sort of your your middle range. I'm doing something a little bit different here, which is applying this warm yellow, because it does a lot of what that rusty red color would do, but it's a little bit brighter and it's a little bit warmer. Two things that I like. <laughs> Who doesn't like brighter and warmer, especially in the middle of winter? We're filming this a couple the day before New Year's. And it's cold and snowy and rainy and wet throughout, you know, a good portion of the world. And um, so anyway, the, but this will kind of infuse the painting with just a little bit of a brighter quality, that kind of Kodachrome glow, which I love. I know not everybody loves it, but hey, if you do, then you might want to do this. I have done many previous episodes where I've shown contrasting um, imprematuras, which is what we just did here, where we might put a, a orange or a blue or a green, and so on and so forth. Uh, they also can change the mood of a painting. It can make it seem slightly menacing if we, let's say, we put a, a cool red under here, right? It would give it that kind of weird glow, which we did on a Yoshitomo Nara painting about two years ago, right? So we've been at this for a while. So we, I've sort of tried to kind of demonstrate as many different ways as possible how this works. Anyway, yada, yada, yada. I was watching lots of Seinfeld reruns with my parents over the holiday. Let's go on to the next step. Okay, so let's talk about who today's artist is is or was because he passed away surprisingly in the 1990s so he he lived a long life but he was also the youngest of his um peer group shall we say um oh did i not show where to download the the template okay just before i do move on if you're wondering how do i find that free dropbox template there is a link in the description below uh the the first uh, images at the top or first files are for our most most introductory basic episodes and then if we scroll down here you'll see 00z08 <laughs> so any of these ones that kind of have an, a letter in them these are our, our more simple introductory episodes and then if you scroll down here all the ones that just begin with, begin with numbers are much more complex including let's say the Mona Lisa and I mean tons of stuff it's not the best organizational system. One of these days I'll change it, but anyway. So, um, let me, you know what, I want to... Let's do this again. 
and then the following pronunciation Casson. I don't know if you can hear it. Let me just mute my microphone. Casson. Casson. Son. Casson. 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 <laughs> okay, everybody get that? Casson. Casson. Okay. So that's how to pronounce to the name of today's artist, A.J. Casson, right? Um, so A.J. is Alfred Joseph Casson, and, you know, born in 1898, dies in 1992. And when I was putting together today's episode, that's really surprised me, because most of his contemporaries, other members of the famous Group of Seven, of which he was a part of, passed away in the 1930s, 1940s, 1960s might be one of the so he outlived everybody else by a couple decades at least uh, he was the youngest member of the group of seven and we'll talk about the group of seven here shortly and how he managed to become a member of the group and his affiliation with that group and who that group were because maybe not everybody watching right now has even ever heard of the group of seven if you're a canadian You've probably heard about the Group of Seven over and over and over dozens of times in school and done a book project on them, but the Group of Seven's probably not that well known outside of Canada. Just like every, every country's got a few artists that are super famous that you might mention to somebody and they're like, what? sorry, who? I, I, what? Right? So, um, so uh, Casson was born in Toronto, uh, which is kind of, I think, I'd have to think about it, but he might be the only member of the Group of Seven actually from Toronto, even though that's generally where they were based. A lot of the, there's a few who were actually born and raised in England, um, some from Northern Ontario, from Quebec. So it's interesting that he's sort of like the authentic Torontonian of the group. Um, so he comes from a Quaker family. Uh, his he was at a, kind of an early age. He was interested in art. Uh, the family moved to Guelph, Ontario, which is, you know, a, a good drive from Toronto for sure. Um, and he studies. Then they move to Hamilton, and you know, so there's like some moving around. I'm not sure. I was I tried to find out as much information as to why, uh, but there was some moving around when when he was a young boy. Uh, his father sent him to become an apprentice in a lithography company. And we've talked about this when we've talked about all the other Group of Seven members because oddly enough, or interestingly enough, almost every single one of them uh, had some training, especially when they were younger, in the lithography process. So in I, just maybe a little bit of context for kind of Canadian art uh, when we go back a hundred plus years is Canadian art has uh, traditionally, you know, was kind of a fringe craft that a person could take on. Um, unlike other places in Europe or even in certain places of, of the United States, particularly around New York or whatever, you might go to school and learn how to paint with the idea of eventually becoming an artist, as we think of an artiste, right? Um, but in Canada, the prospects of becoming an artiste uh, were very low. So unless you were really, really wealthy, like one of his friends, Lauren Harris, you wouldn't, if you were interested, if you showed aptitude for drawing, you wouldn't go to art school and, and with the idea of becoming an artist because the prospects of surviving as an artist were essentially impossible. <laughs> Not a lot has changed in Canada over the past 120 years or so, but if you were interested in drawing, one of the things that you would uh, you would inevitably do as part of your education would be to study in a, uh, li the lithography process. I mean, I'm just thinking about all the artists we've we've talked about um, before. 
I'm, I'm trying to think who didn't have a, a lithography background. I think maybe, I'd have to go back to our Lauren Harris episode, but maybe Lauren Harris, again, being a, from a very wealthy agriculture uh, machinery, his father owned a, well, a machinery company, really the largest in North America. Uh, so he was not uh, of want growing up, but the other fellows did. So lithography is this process where you have, and there's lots of different ways to do lithography throughout history, but for our, for our sake, it's essentially kind of like a stamp process where you might carve into a block, whether that block is like limestone or it's a metal plate, like an etching process, and then you ink it up and you put a piece of paper on top of it and then you put it through this press and you crank it through and the press squeezes the ink off of the paper onto these images of which you know we're seeing a few here below right here's a, a museum or an archive full of lithography stones right because once the great thing with lithography is that you can make multiple versions of the same uh, image you can make lots of prints right and so when you're thinking about the late 1800s there's a huge demand for this like pop culture is expanding quickly you have a, a larger middle class that um, is uh, interested in purchasing the newspaper every morning and and reading a newspaper that's just pure text uh, which is also a, a printing process if you want any images in there, you need someone to create a lithograph, uh, that image to be reproduced over and over again. You know, when I, th let me see, we'll see a few um, other images like, you know, the, the cartoons in the newspaper were done as lithographs. Um, it's not till a little bit later that we get, well, I'm sure color lithography existed from the beginning, but it wouldn't have been used for mass market like in a newspaper as it is today. Um, but, and so here's some people making some ink. Um, or no, this is, they're making tortillas. <laughs> I thought they were, they were making some ink, which is actually not too much different of a process. Um, so anyway, while he's, he's in school, he's, uh, or... or uh, kind of learning these this trade, which would have been a trade as opposed to an art, right? I guess it would have been considered. I'm not, I'm not saying that printmaking is not an art. I, I love print printmaking. I've done lots of printmaking myself. Uh, just want to make sure some people get pretty uh, excited about that kind of thing. Um, but while he was in school, uh, he he's also studies with another fellow, Harry Britton, who also taught a couple of other... Canadians that I'm let me see just while I let's get my facts it doesn't say here who else he taught but I know that name has come up a few times um, so it's possible some of the other members of the group of seven also studied with him so, you know, one of his first exhibitions is the, the CNE, as people in Toronto might, might call it, uh, the Canadian National Exhibition, which is, what would you call that for other, it's like a giant, uh, for many people, it's like in, here in Vancouver, we, would, we have the PNE, the Pacific National Exhibition, um, kind of in Calgary, you might say the Stampede, it's sort of like a, giant agricultural showcase you have people selling livestock machinery you also have rides for kids to keep them busy while the parents are maybe attending some of the the promotional displays so at this age she's uh what 19 years old when he first exhibits there which you know, was probably, you know, still to this day, there's often kind of youth scholarship events um, where younger people are exhibiting their art as part of the exhibition. So I imagine, you know, he, and he's doing watercolor artwork at this time uh, because watercolors are traditionally have been 
one of the least expensive, most accessible types of materials for artists to learn by. Although, as I've said many times, watercolor is probably, I think, the most difficult of all art ma materials and mediums to use. So the irony that is often the first thing people learn is certainly not lost on me. Um, so, uh, you know, he attends uh, the Central Technical School, and which is in Toronto as well, because, the, again, the family moved Guelph to Hamilton, back to Toronto, and that's where he would have got um, really cementing his knowledge on lith the lithography process. Um, from there, you know, jobs were plentiful. As I said, like, there's this middle class that's expanding, and there's lots of jobs for in both the... the you know, newspaper industry, but, you know, in the advertising industry, promotions, brochures, real estate, I mean, goes on and on and on. Every poster that would have been up uh, advertising or promoting any sort of event all over the place, people like Casson would have been um, responsible for creating those images. So the first thing he, he um, gets employed by this company Rouse and Mann, who were uh, one of the major printmaking, lithography, advertising design firms in Toronto at the time. Interestingly enough, at that same, this same company poached many of uh, the the employees of another company called Grip Limited. Grip Limited is where. Um, People like J. E. H. McDonald, Tom Thompson, uh, Arthur Lismer, a few others, also worked at Grip Limited. And when the, the their sort of boss or uh, office manager left the company and went to Rouse and Man, uh, most of the other staff left with him. Um, and turned Rouse and Mann into one of the powerhouses, probably the, the most important advertising firm in Toronto at that time, and, and really uh, hurt Grip Limited. So it's there that he meets a number of other artists who now, uh, who later become the Group of Seven. Um, although by this time in 1919, probably one of the most famous of, of the artist as part of this circle, Tom Thompson, passed away in 1917. So I, as I was putting together today's episode, I was wondering, did, I wonder if Casson ever met Thompson. Uh, I don't think they ever would have met um, because Thompson, even though he did work for Rouse and Man for probably three or four, maybe three years before he passed away, um, I, I obviously he he was dead for a couple of years by the time Casson joined the firm. Um, anyway, while he's there, he he meets Franklin Carmichael, and Carmichael encourages him to go on these expeditions with all of these other guys. They're all men, right? It's, this is a hundred years ago. <laughs> um, so one of the things that these guys would do is they would go on trips to the kind of fringes of Toronto, or in some cases even much further abroad, up to Algonquin Provincial Park, which had been established about 20 years before that, and they would go there and paint. So they'd bring their paint boxes, you know, and a little bit of whiskey, and have a little fun uh, painting and drawing, camping, fishing, etc. And that was sort of the the birth of this gigantic, this really important art movement in Canada that really focused on the the importance of the landscape within Canadian art, and um, I'll talk about the well, a lot of those so those fellas that are part of this um, this kind of scene that are going on these expeditions, they're they're become fixated with this idea that Canada doesn't have an identity of its own, and it needs some art to kind of stand on the world stage to say, that is Canadian art. I don't know a lot about Canada, but that's Canadian, right? And, you know, now we think like, oh, you know, Canadians, oh, there's beavers and back bacon and hockey and so on and so forth. 
a hundred years ago, Canada still being uh, basically a, a British colony, you would you instead of listing those things, you would say basically the Queen. You know, no stores open on Sundays and whatever else is British, right? You wouldn't really, like, the idea of a Canadian identity would have seemed very odd. And 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 certainly, even to some people, is a little bit traitorous, right? Canada st still pledged allegiance to the Queen if you were in school a hundred years ago, you know, just like you would if you were in school in London. All right, so you got all these, these, these guys... Um, most of whom were born in Canada, who are just like, seriously, like, why are we learning how to do everything the way the Europeans do things? Can't we do things our own way? Right? So that's the, you know, that would have been a fundamental part of the discussion as they had when they went away on these weekends. Um, so... While he's away, uh, or well, sorry, while he's kind of hanging out with these fellas and, and working at his job, um, in 1921, the group of seven are formed. Now, Kasson, A.J. Casson is not an original member of the group. Uh, there, originally, there were seven members of the group, and one of the, the, the first founding members here is Frank Johnston or as he changed his name to Franz Johnston in 1925, uh, because he thought it sounded a little bit more arty. Uh, so Franz Johnston is really only a part of the group for a year before he leaves to become a principal at the Winnipeg School of Art. Um, you know, he says here, there was no argument, no big fight in a pub where punches are thrown and pints of glass are smashed. He just moved out of town. He's everyone's in Toronto. This is before email and Snapchat and whatever else. What's happened? Um, so he was like, "Well, I'm kind of far away, and you know, it's really hard to organize exhibitions and shipping and everything. Like, let's. I'm just gonna go my own way." So for this period of time, the group of seven is actually reduced to six people, and one of the the members of the group. Carmichael invites uh, or suggests to the other guys like I got this buddy I work with at Rouse and Man like I, I you know we go on these trips like I think maybe he should take uh, Johnston's place what do you think for whatever reason it takes them another five years to come to a decision to invite Casson to uh, Casson to to be a member of the group so in 1926 he joins. Um, the, the group only exists until, what, 1932. Uh, so, you know, what's that? Um, six years they're together. He's a part of that group. He's exhibiting with them. And, you know, by, by the end of the 1920s, early 1930s, the group of seven had sort of run their course, just like a lot of groups. I think, think of, like, famous bands like the, the Beatles, you know, they only last depending on where you think the Beatles began and ended, you know, eight years, ten years, etc. or so. So the Group of Seven sort of accomplished what they wanted to do, which was to really establish uh, the landscape as an important genre within Canadian art. And then people start kind of exploring different um, ideas, like you have... Um, uh, was it well? Definitely, Lauren Harris ex starts exploring theosophy, cheats on his wife, and gets run out of Toronto and moves to Vancouver. And he's the the, the you know Uncle Moneybags of the group. So uh, the whole thing kind of starts to unravel shortly thereafter. Um, during kind of around this time, he also becomes becomes a, a teacher at the Ontario College of Art. And then later, the art director um, and vice president by 1946. Really, it's not until the last, I think it's 1958, that he retires completely and devotes himself to becoming an artist at age 60, right? So, which is not unusual for the vast majority of artists all the way up until, you know, today, you know, the last few decades, maybe, you could have an artist in their 20s or 30s making a living as an as an artist. 
for the vast majority of human history, artists were had either a day job um, doing something else completely or work were working as apprentices for somebody else um, and and helping that artist produce their work until they got skilled and talented enough that they could then go off on their own and establish their own studio, as it would have been called. Um, what else do I want to mention? Um, you know, I guess in 1924, he gets married shortly after his father passes away, and then the, so he ends up taking care of his mother. His mother moves in with, with the family, and... Um, I'm sure that also put extra pressure on him and, and probably delayed his his um, foray into uh, uh, being a professional, independent artist, making a living on his own until much later. He does all sorts of commissions. Maybe it's time just to take a little bit of a look at... Some of the other paintings that he created here. Actually, you know what? Is, do I have... Okay. Let's see if these... That's better. I mean, look at this painting that he did. Little Island, 1965. So this is towards... I mean, he dies in 1992. So it's to say towards the end of his life is stretching it. But, you know, by the time he's in his mid-90s at the end of his life, he's not producing a lot of new work so this is a painting that he what created in when he's in his late 60s right he would have been 67 68 years old uh, but this would have is like the height of his powers too today's painting is from 1927 but this is really a good kind of distillation of his style here these very chunky thick uh trees right it's again it reminds me of uh, Lauren Harris, who's famous for, do I have any, I don't have, let's just quickly, because uh, Lauren Harris is arguably the most well-known Canadian artist outside of Canada. We don't have any images for Lauren Harris on Wikipedia, are you crazy? Okay, let's, um, we did do a, a, a Lauren Harris painting just the other day. I just thought I would just show some of these images. I think we did this. Did we do that? Yeah, we did that painting together a little while ago, right? Um, this is also a very famous Lauren Harris painting, The Idea of North. Um, or no, that's not what it's called. Is it? No, that's not what it's called. It's called something else. Uh, I don't know what it's called. North Shore. Uh, Lake Superior. So that, just the... The structure of these paintings really reminds me of Casson's work here. Um, I mean, look at that. Look, it's so beautiful. There's just a solidity to the shapes that I think is really beautiful. Like these clouds, you know, they feel like, not marble, but like marshmallow, as opposed to mist we see in, in many other artists' work. Like these trees, again, very... Uh, uh, very typical of his of this of his work. Uh, I mean, look how stylized these trees are. These look like they're maybe made of cardboard um, on a stage set or something, right? They're, the way that they're, you know, like uh, inverted teardrops or something, or feathers. That's another thing that reminds me of feathers. Uh, so again, one of the other things too that he really starts, he kind of leads the way to a certain extent, is during the 19, late 40s, I think, and early 50s, um, they, the, the group of seven members that are still alive start doing these prints, whether some of them are like Christmas card prints or small prints that that every Canadian could own of their most famous works. And again, since almost all of them had a background in printmaking, it's not such a stretch for them to, to create these artworks. So it's interesting because you see a number of these prints of the work of Tom Thompson, who had been dead for 40 years by this point, 
uh, 30 years, um, prints of his work starting to appear that are done possibly by Casson himself. Like, um, I'm not sure which, who would have done them, but somebody would have had to basically recreate those images. Um, okay, so I think that's, that's a bunch here. Uh, oh, I found this really interesting link here. I'll put this in the description below. Just people trying to find the original location for the white pine, which is something, I, there's a, a documentary. I remember seeing at the Vancouver Film Festival a few years ago where there was a group of people who were trying to recreate or trying to locate this, the, the locations for all these very famous group of seven paintings. And um, so here's just uh, an, an article talking about the the attempt to find this. Um, and where was this? This is in the La Cloche region. And to be honest, where is La Cloche? I should have looked this up. Let's... La Cloche Mountains. Hmm. Near Sudbury. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so here's Toronto uh, and Hamilton. Um, Guelph is over here. Um, but... Sorry to reach rubberneck around here. That's interesting. I didn't. I don't know how many other Group of Seven members were painting around this area. Again, most of them were up. So here's Algonquin Park. Maybe let's just close that. So that would have been. That's a, a bit of a journey to get up into this area there. I've never. I've probably taken a Greyhound bus back in the day on my way from Calgary to Toronto um, or driven through there with my folks on big epic family road trips but um, wow now Killarney Provincial Park anyway that's th that's where they're suggesting that painting was created I, I don't know for sure but uh, anyway so uh, maybe just lastly before we move on um, after Oh, you know, there's a couple just a couple things before we move on. I think this is fascinating. One of the final things that that he's doing as part of his like uh, uh, career is helping the the Toronto Police or probably the Ontario Provincial Police at the time. Uh, yeah, OPP. Uh, and you know me, we're um, investigating the the illegal, like the, f the proliferation of fake paintings by artists like Tom Thompson and other members of the Group of Seven. Tom Thompson was not a member of the Group of Seven, but I mean, uh, Tom Thompson and... So, so, so it's interesting that, at, you know, in the latter part of his life, he's spending his time consulting with the police trying to help authenticate various paintings that maybe he himself created, as well as some of his, his friends who by that point had passed on. Uh, and then lastly, he is buried on the grounds of the McMichael Art Collection in Kleinsburg. I, I think I mentioned that before, just north of Toronto. And let me see, they have the, they have, there's Tom Thompson's uh, shack that was, located behind the studio building in Toronto, where many of the other members of the Group of Seven had their studios. I don't think Casson had his had a studio a studio there, though. Anyway, the studio was disassembled in the 1940s and moved to on lo the location. So here's some of the highlights. Today's painting is in this collection. Ah. I was hoping to show you the McMichael Graves where these members of the group of seven are buried. Um, so <laughs> I just think it's so 
bizarre. I don't know if I've ever heard of anything else like this, but uh, the McMichael family was an avid group of collectors, and after all these members of the Group of Seven passed away, they collected the bodies of many of seven members of the Group of Seven, including Casson, uh, or yeah, seven of them are buried on location there. Uh, not all of them, because there was 11 of these men. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly. I can't remember who's buried there, who's not buried there. But um, it's... Uh, let me see. Let's look at Castle's grave. Hmm. Well, show me where... Which one is actually his? Oh, there we are. Ah, come on. There we go. Oh, there we are. So they're these, their grave sites are these just big boulders with their names carved into them, which I think is kind of cool. I mean, I think the whole thing is cool. It's just a little bizarre, slightly morbid. Um, but anyway, let's get into today's painting here. I've been talking, talking, talking for a long time. Okay. So our first step now to on the, or not first, our third step on this painting after we got the image uh, transferred and our imprematura is to start painting the background. Now, sometimes people might do a little bit of some underpainting here on the painting, uh, but I'm going to skip that step just because I think we can, or do we want to do the only, the only part that I would maybe consider doing as a underpainting might be to paint this tree branch and maybe this, or the, the trunk and then the, the sort of fork in the, just so that if you did lose that shape, you're not totally screwed. You'd be able to kind of find where those forms are because Really, what I'm going to be doing in just a few moments here is I'm going to be painting most of this out. So some of this is going to disappear. Should I do that? I was just going to say, I oft, often what I do do is I do do the underpainting and just show people how to, to do that. But I always say, that's this is not what I normally would do. So should I do what I would normally do or do what I... Uh, let's let's do okay let's do okay sorry I'm gonna since this is a class uh, I am gonna let's okay so I am gonna do just a little bit of underpainting here I'm really just gonna paint the tree trunk um, and just a few very small details so that if we lose those details through the subsequent layers of paint we're not screwed we're gonna see a little bit of that information here so Let's mix a dark color. Um, now, if we look at this, we do, let's just do a brown, I think. And we're really just going to do the foreground. So let's do a, a warm brown. So for a warm brown, we're going to take our warm red and warm yellow. Give that a good little mix. And I'm just going to take some blue. Maybe I'm going to take... The more blue you put in here, the darker of brown you're going to get, right? So if our goal is to have a really dark brown that is visible through subsequent layers of paint, then the darker... Like, sometimes I, I mix a black, and we're going to mix a black later on, but um, let's, let's do something just a little bit different. As I said... Some people would literally use that color for their imprimatura, right? Maybe maybe not quite that dark, but you would have used this exact method that I just did here and applied that over the course of the entire painting. That That's m really the one of the most traditional ways of getting your imprimatura established. So let's take a small brush. Okay, let's move that out of the way. And uh, maybe let's put these side by side too. So really, I'm just going to 
I just want to be able to find this. Maybe I shouldn't do it so sloppy because we don't want this to be too thick and then have problems, you know, hiding those lines. I mean, really, that's all I would do, but let's just, I'm just trying to think of. Another thing that, that can be helpful is applying, leaving a little bit of texture here so that it's not too thin. If it's really thin, it can be hard to kind of find those lines later. Uh, let's do this big rock too. also do the horizon line back here. Oh, I forgot to do the rest of that hillside. Okay, no, not a problem. Okay, I think that's good enough. So I'm just gonna blow dry this so that it can kind of be solid because in the next step here, I'm gonna paint over a lot of this. Now, that I there's still probably a little bit here, like you can still see it's still a bit wet. I'm just, just for the sake of time, so I'm not wasting much time blow drying, I'm just gonna keep moving forward, though, you know, my suggestion is, is if you have the time, let it dry and then you don't have to worry because what could happen is as I start painting over this area, I could pick up a little bit of this brown and mix it in and then, people lose their minds because they got brown and they're blue and ah, it's not it's not the end of the world but I know some people get, get really uh, perfection is so important okay um, and there's Jaguar Rex saying hello hi Jaguar good day or good evening yeah depending on where you are in the world so uh, yeah, let's go to our next step here. Okay, so now let's do our background. Let's uh, We've got a little bit of some underpainting just to help give us a guide in case we lose the background in this next step here. Um, I'm not too concerned about, about making it perfect, so I don't care if some of the shapes of the bushes and the trees and rocks and clouds are a little bit different than the original but just saying if you wanted more of that you could spend more time in the previous step so let's just take a look at the colors we want to use so one of the the benefits of using this split primary palette having two yellows two reds and two blues one of each being warm or cool we want to use our cool colors in the background and warm colors in the foreground because warm colors will appear to advance, cool colors appear to recede. If they're side by side, the brain 
just instinctively starts to see that kind of separation. And abstract artists use those same principles as well. To, and the, the in um, and the, the technical term for that is called the push pull effect. Who 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 did the who established a push? Was that Ad Reinhardt? I have to think about who who's uh, kind of uh, said that for the first time. But anyway, the, the having the colors push or pull forwards and background backwards is um, something artists been doing for a thousand plus years. So we want to use our cool colors in the background. So our sky, which is where I suggest we begin, is going to be a cool blue. And if you if you understand these principles of, of warm and cool colors, it can make it so much easier to, to figure out what color to use, right? First of all, having a, a color palette that's simple like this is, is my strongest recommendation if you're a beginner painter, because then you've only got six colors plus white to choose from, right? So you don't have to like, which, you know, you go to the art supply store, there might be 20 different blues. Which blue do you buy? I don't know, right? So here we've got two, right? And then you say to yourself, okay, am I painting the foreground or the background? Oh, I'm painting the background. Okay, that one, we're gonna use our cool blue. Decision made, easy. Right, and if you forget how you mix the color, well, you've only got a few colors here that form that that color, so it just makes life so much easier. So uh, let's uh, put these side by side. Let's move my cool blue over here. So I'm going to take my cool blue, and actually, that's probably I don't even need that much because what we're going to do now is take a lot of white and mix that in. And you'll see, we get that really lovely color. But as you might notice, this is still very blue. And as despite what the original one looks like as being very blue, we realize there's actually a little bit of yellow in there. So there's two things that we can do to get that blue. One of which is we can add a lot of matte medium into this paint. Matte medium is transparent paint. It's just paint that has no powdered pigment in it. And there, sometimes people use this to, to basically uh, seal a painting. People use this for gluing um, puzzle pieces together and sealing them together. Um, so we, we're, we're gonna use a little bit of it. Um, and sometimes people would use a lot of it to get very thin transparent layers. I'm just gonna add a bit more white here, just so I have a lot. Because another thing too, I wanna make sure that if I need, I'm gonna have a bit of this paint left over later to do any touch-ups, right? Very important. Okay, so it's a little bit blue, but I think we want a little tiny bit of teal. So I'm gonna take a bit of my yellow, and not too much, because otherwise it's gonna go green. Mix that in here. Very subtle. And still not quite there yet. In fact, I'm going to take just a bit more blue. Oh, that was a bit maybe too much. That's okay. Um, because now... I'm going to take my matte medium. I think that those big buckets are big jars of paint, you know, if they and they start to kind of dry out in the middle and you sometimes notice a little chunky bits start to form in there. Uh, that's the, you, know, you get, these things are cheaper when you buy them in bulk, 
but as it gets down, especially if the paint starts to dry, a skin might form over top of there, or little chunks that are near the top kind of crystallize and fall down into the paint. I'm telling you, that can be kind of drives you crazy. So let's take this mixture of paint. I, I, you know, I still think I want a bit more blue in there. And I'll put a bit more yellow in there. Now there is the yellow from the painting, my imprimatura, which will come into play and also make this kind of a little bit more yellow. So, I might do an, a second layer of this, we'll see. You know what, I'm just going to paint right over right remember this is the sky and the sky is going to be behind all those clouds etc so if we have a bit of this sky right? this is what I was saying we might lose some of those trees Actually, I didn't, uh, that, hmm, I kind of like how that looks. I think I might, what I might do here is just blow dry this. I just want to make sure I don't have a big gap of blue on this far side or anything. I think that's good. Let's, let's blow dry it. Just see as it dries, the transparency level is going to change. Some more of this yellow is going to come through. And, you know, it's a little bit thin in a few places. Am I fine with that? Or do I want it to be a little bit uh, more solid? Let's see. Okay. So let's just take a look. Yeah, you know, I could put a little bit more yellow in there and do it again. Oh, do I want to do that? You know what? It's the end of the year. Let's not spend this time fuss. Well, okay. Here I am just like, let's not spend all this time fussing. And then here I am <laughs> fussing. I think is, oh, that's part of clouds anyway. Let's cover that up with clouds. There's just this little bit of the cloud that uh or my the painting that was a little bit thin there so i'm just 
Oh, this is a bad idea, Michael. What on earth are you thinking? <laughs> Just the canvas had torn there because one of the things that happens is if these canvases sit for a long time back to back or front to front they'll stick together which is why they come wrapped in plastic right so that they don't um stick together okay so i'm just gonna take this paint scoop it up into a little pile here That way I have some extra if I need to do touch-ups later. Obviously I didn't mix it thoroughly enough so it might be a little bit uneven still, but anyway, I've got it. And there's Mariano says hello. Kathy says, I never heard of the group of seven in school, but I am a West, I am in the West coast of Canada. That's strange. Um, maybe you were sick that day. <laughs> um, group of seven, I mean, at least these days is, is certainly taught in school. There's usually a, a day or a week looking at, at these artists if there's art programs in school. And not every school has art programs anymore. Pascaline says, it's easy for me to say Casson. Because of the, the... It's funny, I mean, it's there's a there's kind of a bit of a Frenchness to that accent, even though he's an Anglophone from Toronto, right? But that's Canada for you. The, one of the great things that I think we should celebrate of Canada is the diversity uh, and um, generally the ability for different groups to get along. <laughs> Okay, so let's just look at the next step here, these clouds. One of the reasons why I didn't do the warm, or sorry, the the blue throughout the entire clouds is we can see that he did not do that either. What he's done instead is he's he defined where the clouds were and then painted around them. So these clouds don't have any blue underneath. You know, mine will have a little bit, but that's okay. Um, but for the most part, he's, yeah. So you can even actually see, if we look really close in here, see that? That's the imprematura. That's the brown that I was talking about coming through. Um, but I think ours, that yellow, I think is going to look kind of cool. So let's just back out. So essentially what we're going to do now is mix a cool gray. And we could use the same, if you wanted, you could use the same color we just mixed and we could turn this into a gray. But let's just, for the sake of, of learning, let's just do it all over. What size of brush do I want? We've got a lot of gray, so let's mix lots of gray. Uh, let's just, uh, I don't want to put that down. Um, let's do it down here, I think. So we're going to take our cool blue. It doesn't matter if there's a little bit of white in there because we're making gray. If we wanted to make a black, don't want any white in there. That's going to influence things big time. I think we're going to need all that yellow. I could have just squeezed more out, but who knows if I'll use it again. So, mix this into a nice green. And you could mix this all up really nice. I mean, that's not too far off some of the color we're going to use for the tree branches later. But that's good for now. And so what we want to mix a black, we want cool blue, cool yellow, and warm red. And the reason why we want to do that, just as a quick refresher that what we've just done here is taken our cool blue cool yellow mixed that and we've got maybe there's a little bit more blue so it's a little bit closer to here what's the opposite of that 
warm red. And when we add that warm red, it's gonna pull that green towards the middle, or you could say that green is gonna pull that warm red towards the middle, and boom! In the middle, we got black. And of course, you put a little bit of white in there, and then you got gray, right? So, let's do just that. Take our warm red. And you notice how I just put a little bit to the side there? That way, it's not quite dark enough. I can just scoop a little bit more in there. Now, I think this is going to be a little bit closer to a purple, because I don't think I put enough yellow in there, although... We're pretty close. I think I do need a bit more yellow. One thing, if you're mixing your own black, the the hardest thing is telling, is identifying, is this actually black, or is this purple? Is it green, or is it brown? I don't know, because it's so dark. So, the way to, to define what its actual color is, is take a little bit of white. Let's just take a little bit of white and mix it down here. Ah. Now, I don't know what it looks like on, on your computer or, or TV screen at home, but this is actually a little bit greenish. Now, why is that? Why is it a little bit green? I want gray. I want neutral gray. That's frustrating. What did I do wrong? Well, let's just think about it for a second. We took cool blue, cool yellow, and mixed a green. And then we wanted to neutralize it with the warm red. It still looks green. So we need a little bit more red. All right? Put a little bit more red in here and wow. I can see the color shifting from a really, really dark green into a dark, dark, dark gray, because there's a little bit of white still on my brush here. And so let's do that again. Let's take a bit more white. I don't know if you can see that, but that's our neutral gray. So just think about, you know, if you're, when you're mixing these colors and mixing your three colors and you're trying to get black and it's not, it's not easy to do, especially the first time. I probably make it look really easy because I'm just like a chef who just does a little handful of this and mix it together and you get good dough, right? Um, I've just been doing this for decades, so... But if it's a little bit green, we need to use more red. If it's a little bit more purple, we need to add a bit more yellow to pull that purple back into the center. If it's a little bit kind of orangey or brown, that's because we got a lot of yellow and red, and we need to use the blue to pull that towards the middle, or use that orange or brown to pull the blue towards the middle. All right, same sort of thing. Okay, so now we've got our gray mixed. Um, let's just let's just take a look at the original. We do have, I mean, I could just paint that this color I got on my brush, maybe a little bit more white. I could paint that right down on that bottom strip. I could use it up here. I do want to, I'm probably going to start with my lighter colors. I always find it easier to darken than it is to lighten. Um, so I'm going to start with my, my light grays. And notice how there's a lot of yellow coming through here. Now, he probably put a little bit of yellow into his white. The other thing we can do is just use the imprematura to kind of um, make a semi-transparent white layers and have some of that yellow on the canvas coming through. Whatever way you want to do it, it's up to you. Um, let's, let's, take, let's take a lot of white. Not nearly enough, okay. As I said, it's so much easier that a color will darken a much quick, more quickly than it'll lighten. So, oops, sorry. If I wanted this to get um, lighter, 
and I want it to be as light as what we saw on the screen, I need to use all of this white, right? And that's a lot of white, and I'm not going to use all that white. So instead, I'm going to make a separate mixture over here. And you notice there was a little bit of blue and stuff in there. It's okay. And I just have that excess paint that was still on my brush. And look, I wiped that around, and now it's still pretty white. And it's actually also a little bit green, because remember when I mixed that brush, or that paint, it had some maybe more of the greenish paint in there. So let's just... Do it again. That's still pretty white, or still pretty dark. Like if we look at, uh, let's put these side by side. Yeah, way, way too. Um, so in this instance, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take my matte medium here. Whoa. <laughs> All, uh, not that much, ideally, but take a little bit of it. I'm just going to put it right on my brush like this. And this is probably just too much, but... So you can see how transparent this paint is, right? So this is way too dark for what I was planning on doing. But you know what? This is probably what some other people are going to encounter themselves. So in solidarity with those people who might have got a little bit of a darker color than they wanted let's just move forward with it together and if you're using a much lighter mixture then hey you're totally fine you did you've done a great job where that other hill goes somewhere down here like that Right, so you can see some of that green coming off of my brush. So I'm just taking actually a little bit more matte medium. Ah, see, it's starting to kind of dry up, seize up on me. That's okay. This means I'll have to let it dry, and then we'll do it again. Okay, so not what I was expecting or wanting or planning to do. Um, I'm gonna let's take some more white. Just massage that into the paint here. a little bit closer to what I wanted. Now I'm going to blow dry this and, and go back over it with the paint I just used.
Okay, I'm just, let's just take this paint, um, and I'm just gonna go back over top, well, maybe not over all of it, let's, let's just chill out, Michael, here, let's get, <laughs> oh, this lighter color. Notice how I'm not concerned about, like, the perfection of these shapes. He's still, still way too gray. And it's kind of a bummer because I've really covered up a lot of that yellow. So if I had started with something that was a little bit lighter, um, I would have had that nice warm yellow kind of infusing this color. All is not lost. The, the reason I just sort of showing you, uh, you know, I could have spent more time getting the color perfect before I did it. But sometimes knowing if it's perfect or not you don't really know until you do it so i know f if this was happening because i i hear that in the discussions on the facebook group if this happens people are freaking out like ah oh, it's a disaster it's not a disaster it's not a disaster what we're gonna do is we're, we're going to just continue working on it we can lighten it up we can put a little bit of warm yellow into the clouds and everything will be fine it's just painting didn't hasn't gone the way that we necessarily wanted it to to go, but that's okay. I'm gonna let that dry for a second, and I'm gonna move on to the hills back here. So to that those hills, this is a, a cool blue with our black, right? And remember, this was done with cool with cool blue anyway, right? So let's put a bit of, where should we do that? Let's do it right there. I know there's going to be a little bit of this uh, white coming in there, but that's okay because it's not a perfect, we don't want it to be black anyway. We want a little bit of it to be a bit of a gray. And that's pretty close. Maybe even a little bit too blue. But I think it'll be okay. Now you can see as I paint that blue over top of this warm yellow, it actually kind of goes a little bit green. So if that happens, that's okay. That's just, you know, it's the colors are mixing optically rather than mixing them on our palette. They're, they're still mixing just mixing inside of our brains as opposed to on the palette and I'm just painting right over these these uh, leaves So I'm going to do another layer of that, but that establishes a really nice dark uh, under a layer, under painting, a, a different way of thinking about under painting. Some people would consider this to be the under painting as opposed to just that, those brown lines that I painted there previously. Okay, so let's keep on moving forward. I know things aren't all done, no problem. I think our last step
step here is I'm going to put this uh, kind of a sky color here. So you notice this is different than this. It's kind of a little bit in between. I think basically what we can do is take this same color, put a little bit more warmy blue into it here. I'm going to switch down to a bit of a smaller brush. So let's take a bit of this color here. Maybe, in fact, rather than just, let's just mix a bit of this blue right in there. Just a bit more. So what, it, what I'm basically doing here is mixing kind of like a cobalt blue, which is a very famous blue. And it kind of exists in between the, the warm blue and the cool blue that I've chosen here. Right? Some people will just use cobalt, but we can kind of, re since cobalt exists between here, we can kind of basically recreate it. That is pretty good. Again, it's not going to be perfect, but we don't want it to be really perfect at this stage anyway. We're just painting the painting, uh, the, the basic colors. In, and we're going to refine things over the next little uh, few more steps. So the other thing too is I just I'm just going to try to get a little bit like where that yellow's showing through. I want to make sure I'm kind of covering that up. There's been times where we've deliberately left little gaps in between the paint where it met where they intersect or interlock together. In this case I think having a little bit more solidity works for this style of painting. So you know, the finished version, maybe it's just, a, I'll just bring this back up here. The finished version of this painting was done in a studio. And he would have had, he probably did a sketch of this on location in La Cloche, uh, there in kind of Western Ontario, towards the Manitoba border. And he probably would have painted this painting very close to the way that I've started it. Um, and then gone back to his studio in Toronto, and because he knew where he wanted the clouds to be, he's not sort of painting it in, in kind of layers like this. He's literally just sort of painting like puzzle pieces that interlock together. So you can certainly do that, and you know, you could paint around these different trees. He's the painting, original painting, is much larger than this, and so it makes that a lot easier easier to do. Here it's been reduced like five times the size, so um, we don't see the little nitty-gritty of the details here. Let's see these side by side. So you can see that's still actually kind of a little bit bright, surprisingly. Um, now, you, know, you can see definitely as you know, right here, how much darker the one on the left is to the one on the right. But this is also lighter than the one on the right. And our brains play very funny tricks on us. Anyone who's spent any time looking at optical illusions will tell you that, you know, a color, um, the same color in two different places can look much darker or brighter, or more green or blue, depending on what color is adjacent to it. Oh, there's John and Pascal saying hi. Pascal says, I strayed from the underpainting a little bit, usual method, yep. <laughs> I wish I had sunflowers to paint. Instead, I'm just going to eat some sunflower seeds. That's that's good. I'm allergic to sunflower seeds, which is a bizarre uh, allergy. My father eats sunflower seeds compulsively. I, maybe that is uh, 
you know, maybe I, I don't know how that possibly happened, but it happened. Okay. Going on to my favorite tea here before I switch to the next step. Mmm. The cream of Earl Grey is the best. So, now that we've got some paint, <laughs> largely uh, the quote-unquote wrong paint in the right places, we're not going to freak out. We're just going to now paint the foreground. And really, by when I say the foreground, I'm just going to paint these uh, big rocks down here on the bottom. So let me just turn my the baby monitor off. <laughs> So, um, I'm going to paint that down there, and then uh, we're going to go back. Oh, sorry. Let's, got confused with my daughter walking around. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to paint this area down here first. I'm not going to worry about painting the trees. That's really going to be one of the very, very last things I'm going to do. I'm going to work on this area. I'm going to go back. I'm going to finish the sky, the mountains, the water, and then even this area down here. And then, last but not least, I'm going to do the trees over top of all of it. As I said, that is not necessarily the way everybody would make this painting. Some people would... would, would they might even paint the tree first. And it's entirely possible that uh, A.J. Casson did that um, he might have, let's say he, let's, because, you know, if we zoom in here, we can see that he's not layering the paint at all. Like, let's say this cloud right here, it ends, he paints that brown, and then he paints the white around it. So one of the tech, and you can even see down here, we can see uh, he might have painted this little bit of the tree and then painted right around. So, you know, there's lots of different ways to make a painting. The, so you might say, well, why are we doing it like this if that's not really the way that he did it? It's because I'm thinking for many people, this might be the fastest and easiest way to do it. Um, if you're, if you are absolutely hell bent on painting it exactly the way it was, yeah, for sure. Paint the tree first, do all those little details. It's going to, you're going to have a nightmare painting the sky around all those little tree branches at this 9 by 12 size scale but do whatever you want this way yeah we're not we're gonna lose some accuracy I've, I've lost a lot of the detail of where the, the the clumps of trees and branches are but I'm not concerned at all about replicating it exactly the way it is so and there's Nikki says hey guys I'm here now hi Nikki great to see you Okay, so let's, as I said, let's work on the bottom down here. So you'll recall way back at the beginning of the painting for my underpainting, I mixed this warm brown. Now, if you have any of that warm brown left over, you can use it. If you don't, that's okay, because I'm probably, this is kind of, well, it's a little bit dried out. Um, what I'm... I'm basically going to kind of mix it again. This brown is my warm yellow, my warm red, and warm blue. The reason it's so dark is I just put a lot of warm blue in there. So let's just mix a bit of this together again. We want it to be relatively light. All right, because what we're going to do now is we're going to take some white. Mix that in there, and I'll just show you side by side. Let's zoom in. I'm going to start with my lighter color here. And you can see that it still looks very yellowy. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of my black. I'm going to put that in there. And that's actually going to turn this from just a, a brown, and I don't know, like a, a brown that I've lightened. Um, uh, to a 
slightly gray. That's pretty good. I didn't just need more white in here, but let's put more white in there. And I think that's pretty close, right? So let's take that. And I wonder, I mean, again, I mean, look at the level of detail in here. What we could do is we could paint uh, you know, this little bit of yellow, or the color I've just mixed here, I could go around every single one of these shapes. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to paint this color. Right over top of everything. And then later on... I'm going to go and paint those darker shapes over top of this. So this is my quick and dirty method. You know, I'm losing a lot of the detail in there. That's okay. And don't worry about making it perfect here. I'm just mixing it again. So I kind of ran out. Okay, so you'll see, you know, you can see that, you know, really that area was the, the place that had most of that highlight, and then it's getting darker as we go into the shadows over here, and it, so I could, yes, have just painted this little area, this color, and then done gray over top, or just a separate, you know, shape of gray there, and that's, I know that's the way a lot of people would do this. Again, uh, I'm not in a hurry, but uh, it's just this is just faster um, doing it in this particular way. Then I can just paint those shapes over, and if I want little areas of this to sh to to be there, I don't have to paint it. I just don't paint over it, right? It's just gonna stay there. The other thing too, I, I should also mention is the, the color we use, this is a warm brown, so it's gonna sit on the in the foreground. It's it's gonna be right there. It's, it's closer to us uh, in terms of the principles of color theory. It's closer to us than anything else here. So it just, our, our brain tells us that this is the, this is the foreground without even having to use um, other ways to create depth such as overlapping shapes, scale, etc. Oh, I just realized like, these camera batteries. Uh, I'm gonna have to mute my microphone for a moment. So you, you take a week off and everything just seems <laughs> like you're like what how do i do things around here Just popped in here. 
it's cool when when in somebody else pops into the chat and is like, hey, how's it going? Um, Paula, you're roasting your, you're, are you roasting your own pistachios right now? Oh my goodness, I want to come over to your house. I love pistachios. I've never had homemade roasted pistachios. Or are you just eating roasted pistachios? That's so, oh, mm. I, I have to be careful of pistachios because I'll eat all of them. And you're making everybody hungry. Pascal's getting hungry. Nikki's been painting for a while. Just remember class is going on. Okay. Let's, uh, okay. So first, just before I move on to the next step here, I just want to say that I like what's happened here. It's not, it's not maybe necessarily ideal, but it's not a disaster. I, I can't even really think of what could have made it a disaster. So if you're looking at your painting and it's kind of like this, and then you look at the original and you go, what on earth have I done wrong? You haven't done anything wrong. You're still, you're, you're, doing, you're doing great, right? Does it look like the original at this stage? No, of course not, <clears throat> but we're not screwed. Life isn't over. You shouldn't give up painting and take up skydiving instead. We're gonna make it work, no problem. You just always remember that we are so used to seeing finished paintings in museums and art galleries that we don't see these stages of a painting virtually ever, except like you're doing right now. So you just have to remember, okay, this is okay. This is just, we're just on, a, this is a particular stage of the painting. We're just, uh, this is what we expect to see here. No problem. Okay. So we've got the painting kind of well started. Our first pass on the background and foreground have established things. As I said, they're not exactly what I would have wanted maybe here. But, you know, as I always say, it doesn't have to be perfect. We're, I really just want to put colors in roughly the right place and then I can move on. So that's what we're, we're about to do right now. We're, we've got colors roughly in the right place. And now, just so we can, see, oops, uh, we can see them side by side. So what I want to do, you know, potentially right here, I could decide to do more, put another layer of blue over there. You know, mine is a little bit more blue and a little bit less yellowy uh, or teal than the original. It's hard to tell though. One of the things with uh, my camera set up is that things, the red is cranked up like three or 4%. So that's sometimes, it might look closer on camera, but mine in person is a little bit off, if that makes any sense. So I'm always kind of, and the reason why I've cranked that up is it makes my, it's a little bit more flattering to my own skin tones. If I, if I, keep the the reds at the normal level then I look really pale and I kind of look pale anyway so I'm I'm using the technology to help me any way I can <laughs> um so uh but I so I'm happy with that so the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm, let's start painting these clouds so again there's two ways we can go about it we can paint the white and lighten things or we can paint the darker colors, the darker grays, and darken it. Whatever way you want to go about it. I think I'm going to just uh, lighten things, though. So where was the color? This is where we were painting originally. Let's take more white. I'm going to put this white here. Let's take our gray. I don't want much of it. I want mostly... But I, I'm happy using my matte medium which is what this is it's going to make it a little bit more transparent and you know what i'm going to steal a little bit of this warm yellow oh it's too much michael what were you thinking look how quickly i should have just that's too much too much okay no problem no problem if we've gone too far let's do it again i'm not going to clean my brush because I, I i did that deliberately 
because I wanted that color. Whoa, that's too much gray in there. That's okay. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. Just take more white. I do want a bit more of that yellow back. The reason I'm putting a bit of that yellow is I is I lost some of that yellow when I painted a few of those layers on there. So let's paint. Ooh, that's great. Maybe even too white. Okay, so maybe it, maybe my instinct here was right all along. I just need more. Right, so it's one of those things where you paint it, you mix it on your palette, and you're like, oh, that's perfect. That's oh, it's too dark, and then you paint it on your painting, and you're like, whoa, that's too light. Let's just paint this whole thing like this. You know, I could have put more of that yellow in there after all. Let's just get a bit more. Yeah. There we go. Now, it's true that putting that warm yellow into these clouds pulls these clouds forward. Um, as, but he is using this warm yellow. Now, the warm yellow is probably more from the Impune Matura that he used, that warm brown, than I don't think he put uh, yellow in. And it's also always possible that that's the kind of the varnish that's on top of this has caused the painting to kind of yellow a little bit it's always hard to say what's what but go even more but I'm, I'm okay let's just oh just want to mix uh, okay I keep telling myself <laughs> uh. mix that in good and then now I'm just gonna take smaller brushes and just start putting in some of these small little happy clouds as Bob Ross used to say You know, one of the things I think is cool, I, I see all the time, is often versions of paintings that you guys are doing are better than the painting I've done. Um, and that makes me really happy and doesn't make me sad or insecure or anything. Often because it's like, you get to watch me do the first draft of the painting, and then you can kind of follow 
you know, correct or learn from my mistakes, really, right? So, you know, if you're like, oh, he, he's upset because <laughs> he didn't do this or that, and then later on he changed his mind, it's like, okay, well, I'll just, when I do mine, I'm just going to start from, uh, from that place. Anyway, let's do, let's make sure this is dry before I put my wrist or anything on there. Let's now take us. I'm taking a smaller brush. Now it's possible that these clouds are going to be a little bit different than the ones I just painted. Yeah. So because there wasn't any, um, there's a lot more white, or there's several layers of paint here and here. I'm just painting directly into the onto the blue sky. So I need to add more white, less. Um, of the, the matte medium in there. So as I paint this, what I'm thinking to myself is I wanna capture the kind of quality of his clouds, the structural quality, the puzzle piece-ness of them. So let's zoom in. And this is me just being a little bit uh, heavy handed with my paint. So I'm just going to wipe off all that excess and just go a little bit uh, thinner application so I don't get those big ridges. And I'm just going to kind of make a little bit of stuff up here. I don't care if it looks exactly like the original. One thing you sometimes want to just keep an eye on is that you're not, you don't create some weird shape in here, like a swastika accidentally, or, you know, I mean, goodness, that's the worst thing that happens is you paint for a little while and then you're like, you're like, ah, it looks like I'm so happy with it. And then the next person to look at it is like, um, uh, yeah, I don't uh, feel very comfortable with this painting hanging in my house. And like, why? What, what's... It's just a, a landscape. Well, the swastika in the sky is kind of a bit of a turn off. Like, oh no. So I'm gonna just step back a little bit and make sure that we don't have anything in there, unless that's your, uh, <laughs> unless that's something you're into. Um, in which case, maybe you might want to find a different teacher. Not really something I'm into. I don't. I, I don't know if I'm going too far out on a limb there. I'm not too concerned with alienating my neo-Nazi um, audience. <laughs> That's quite the tangent, hey? Um, yeah. So you could see, like, again. You know, mine here, when I look at it, I can see that yellow um, in the paint, that bit of a brown. On camera, it you know, especially like, it maybe looks a little bit there. Side by side, it's like, whoa. So another thing that I could do, like you see how much whiter it looks here. If at the very end, I still feel it needs to get a little bit lighter, I could just take a glaze 
of warm yellow and go over the whole thing. And that would be, I would instantly give it a bit more of a, a warm glow to it. Let's, um... I also am not concerned with my paint being a little bit more transparent and opaque in certain places because, hey, have you ever looked at a cloud before? Clouds are not one solid block. You know, does AJ Casson, um, Casson, does he have more solidity to his shapes? Sure, absolutely. Um... Do you need to necessarily paint it exactly like he did? No, you don't. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, every, every day I, I get notifications about comments here on YouTube and people are always telling me, oh, it's so refreshing, like you're approach to just not worrying about being perfect it's such a breath of fresh air which is you know i really appreciate i also just think like wow what are who, who are people's art teachers out there who are so obsessed with perfection such like a negative you know approach it just alienates so many people from actually making art Okay, so I'm going to put like a little arc of shapes up here. So let's zoom out. So you, again, me painting all of these over top of the blue is not the way that he did it in this particular painting. Um, that's okay. I need to, I want to make this come down a little bit more. Well, let's let that dry for a few minutes because there's no point if I keep on trying to paint that while it's drying It's just gonna get angry with me. So let's go the opposite direction and let's start painting some of these grays over top of it Now I've got I bit remember I made my own gray so I can just use this gray that I painted previously uh, I just made a black and I added white to it, right? So we're just I'm just gonna paint more shapes Let's go up to the top left there.
It's like a little M here. And I can, I'm also going to modify a little bit of that with a little bit of blue later on and another quick layer. That's pretty good. I feel like maybe I'm going to, I'm going to do a bit more, come over here a bit more. So I see a letter taking shape here. I'm like, oh, I don't want that letter. That's... Okay, so let's go back the other way now. Um, let's take, let's just scoop some of that previous paint there's some matte medium that's pretty goopy you now it's kind of dried a lot so it's gonna mix some white into it just don't want it to be quite so dark I'm just kind of blending it out with more and more matte medium. And I'm just going to now take the previous color, my white, and let's just kind of go back into this and just soften the edge.
assuming you want to soften the edge, of course. Because if we're doing this kind of quickly, that paint is just going to kind of blend. Okay. And then let's go back the opposite. So take a bit more of this gray in its more complete form. The one I painted up here with. Right, and if I feel like that's a little bit harsh, then let's just blend this back in. Just with the lighter color again. That's okay. So I'm, now I'm just going to go back with this. Remember I, I mixed this earlier. Oops. Just putting a second layer here. Oops, sorry, I'm not on camera. Uh, let's move over here. Okay, I'm just a little unhappy with this 
shape here. Let's just... And you know what? There's... I'm going to take a little bit more yellow and go in here. And... Oh, that's very yellow. It's okay. It's just painting, right? I like how that looks, actually. I guess that's kind of cool. So let's just brush that in here. This is, again, a little bit more warm yellow. It's also not so bad that we have a warm color in this area because um, this is going to, these clouds up top, if I just back out, these clouds up top are much closer to us than the sky or the clouds further in behind. So if there is a little bit of this warm yellow up here, then it's okay because it is closer to us. It's, it's um, and remember our warm colors advance, our cool colors recede. So let's just uh, back that out. Probably this is a little bit more heavy handed. Actually, it looks okay on camera. We'll see if it, you know, in person it's like, ooh, I don't know, Michael. I don't think I'm going to keep all of this though. I might just, because I'm going to paint a little bit of white. Uh, back over top of some of these areas as well. This is sort of like me faking the imprematura back into the painting. Okay. Now there are those clouds moving across. Don't want to do that now. Well, that's probably a good idea to do that now. Let's take some more white. I need, need to cover up some of that black.
I mean, this little area here is pure genius. It's showing the clouds, the layering of clouds on top of one another. And it's great. It's a super subtle little effect that he's doing here, but it adds a lot of depth. So wait for that to dry as it's drying. I've just got, this is mostly just like white with a little, that I'm kind of just mixing in here. I just took some white, just mixed it in a bit to my colors here. And I'm just going to, I'm just kind of painting. Even that, it's too much. That's okay. If I go too much, I can always paint it back out. So now I'm going to paint some kind of white shapes into these clouds. Very subtle effect, kind of cool though, and just outlining as well right here. Along the edges. Building that up. Uh, I'm going to come back and touch that up in a moment, but let's just move down here. So we got there this darker brown. Let's take a bit more of this dried matte medium. Some white. Now, I also have to be very careful about going too dark with my gray. Because so I go too dark with this gray. In fact, I should also put just a bit more cool blue in there. to uh, Because I don't want these this dark... If, if my clouds in the background here get too dark, then they're going to compete with things in the foreground. And that can be dangerous because then we have things lurching forward that are supposed to be way far in the background. Like, I am a little concerned with how dark that cloud is. It's kind of what he did, but, you know, it's, you know, uh, he's a, one of the great artists of all time. Uh, so I'm, I'm following his lead here, but I, I do just want to make, point that out, that I am uh, on a bit of thin ice when you're painting such dark colors in the background. It is nice having that little bit more blue, cool blue in these, um, in this area. In fact, let's paint some shapes. So these are gonna be these shapes that I'm painting right there.
and so there's going to be a darker band of of uh, clouds going across there. And then let's just take let's take a bit more of a blue it's too, too much. Ah, I got some warm blue. I don't want that. Man, I could have done a little bit more blue there, but that's okay. Looks, that's uh, okay. It looks a little more gr more neutral gray on my side. It is a little bit more blue than I think it actually looks. So I'm getting there. I know it might not be so satisfying because we see there's you know the big tree in the middle. It's missing, and like, what are we doing? We're still progressing there. We just got. Uh, uh, we're going to keep on going. So let's take some more of this black. Take a bit more of that blue. So I contemplated uh, blow drying all of this before I started painting this right here. And I thought, you know what, I kind of maybe want it to be... I want a little bit of that blending to happen as he's got going on. He's painting obviously with oil paints. So there's a bit more of a curve here.
I'm gonna go back to my lighter. I'm just painting like what the painting is telling me in some places here, shapes that have just appeared as I painted. I'm, I'm rarely looking at the original here too. Okay, let's go back to the darker one. I could, that's almost like too bold, like it could be way more subtle than that, so that's okay. Let's, uh, let's plow ahead though. I think I'm, well, the only thing I just want to fix this cloud here, let's just get a bit more warm yellow. Blobs. Let's just ah, get a bit of red on there. Let's get. Okay, now this hillside. Um, so that was my cool blue and black. Quite a lot of cool blue and some white. Not bad. Okay. And now as I go, I can just add a little bit more nuance. Paul says the fan is running wild in the background. I'm sorry about that. Or that's got to keep this house heated there. 
Sometimes it's definitely louder than others. Other times, for sure. Oh, is my mic? What's going on here? One second. Hopefully that helps a little bit. I think my, my microphone slipped down my shirt. So we just want to kind of see if we can get just a few more little bumps and you know things in the far horizon there. So that it continues to look like a mountain or hills Stand it when I'm not on camera. Oops. Okay, now he's got. Maybe well, let's let this dry. Um, now you can see the beautiful thing that he's doing here is these very subtle kind of. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit of that. Let's we'll do. Hmm. I almost think maybe I should have gone a little bit lighter here to do that, but... Because again, I'm pushing the darkness pretty severely in that area. It just means as I get closer to the foreground, I'm gonna have to, I'm going to end up having to use some black on its own. I may even, worse comes to worse, break out the actual tube of black paint, right? That's why you, I, I prefer not to paint and mix with black paint because then I've always got it in my back pocket. Oh, oh no, my background's too dark. Uh, what am I gonna do? I'm screwed. Oh, I always got the black paint. If I want some something to leap forward from uh, in front of the background, you put some actual black in there and your, your problem goes away. <clears throat> Oops, just see this is not quite level here. Okay. Let's do a little bit more of that. I'm just going to darken this color even more. Don't have to do it dramatically different either, right? Just putting, again, more cool blue in there. It's just gonna keep yanking this color backwards in space, even though there's a lot of dark black in here.
So I'll paint that there first. Let's let's kind of rises up, doesn't? Beautiful. So now we want to get. I'm just gonna get rid of that ridge there. Um, now I want to get some of the subtle. Like it's a little bit darker on the outer edges of this. So to help with that, I'm gonna use some satin glazing fluid, and that's gonna allow me to get. Uh, actually, you know what? Before I even put this down, just clean the brush. I'm gonna blow dry that because I want to. I'm gonna do a little bit of delicate glazing around those edges, just to darken them and then blend it out. So we have the darkest edge, and then it kind of blends into something lighter. Uh, we did this with one of our Chinese artists. I think uh, we did a whole month of art from China, and obviously, like what we're about to do here is is like a, one of the primary tex techniques of Chinese painting. So let's just blow dry. So just as I was, uh, it's Lee Kieran, um, who's, which one was that? That's um, the Jingyang Mountains from 1976, that episode we did on May 25th, 2021. Um, so let's, let's take our glazing fluid. Assuming it's not all blocked up and shooting paint out. There we go. Oh, that's too much. That's okay. So I'm going to take now my paintbrush, which has just got that darker color. Let's get a little bit more of it on here. And just blend it into our glazing fluid. Take, I'm just taking more, let's take some more black. Again, glazing is fantastic for if you're a little bit afraid of going too dark too quickly. So just kind of, you don't have to go too, too far, too intensely. You can use your finger or you can use a, another brush. So to I can paint that. 
just take another brush to kind of just blend that in a bit. To soften those edges. And you know what, I can even, I'm just gonna take this and go and you know, I wasn't happy with the way I blended that, so I'm just going to make that mountain go in front of the other. Ooh, that's great. I love it. And so after this dries, it might get a little bit, you know, the, the, the difference might kind of go away a little bit. And you might lose some of the, what we just see here. You might have to do it again. It's okay, because you can see how easy it is, right? It's not, not rocket science. The only thing that can maybe um, trip some people up is just going too dark or not putting enough uh, glazing medium or because you can also do this with matte medium it's a little bit trickier with matte medium because that dries so much faster let's go back to the left here and I'm just going to do one mountain right in the middle here let's just go He does have another one in there. I'm just a little worried that the scale of my painting might be so small that you might not see that. Hmm, what should I do here? Now the tree is going to be right there. I'm just going to carry this through here. do that actually second thought let's So I guess, you know, at this stage, I just started asking myself, are we done with the background? Are we ready just to commit 100% to the foreground? The answer is, um, 
I'm ready to go into the foreground and start painting the rocks and then the trees. But I don't know. I don't know if the background is fully finished. I reserve the right to go back in and touch things up if I need to. Um, because it's, you know, the, I, I think the background looks fantastic right now, but it's possible that once things start filling up in the foreground, I feel differently about the background. And I want to go back and touch things up a little bit. So don't ever feel like you just got to have to like say goodbye to the background and never ever go back and, and touch it up or anything. That's why we always have our little finishing touches at the end of every episode. Uh, let me plug my phone in here. Okay, so, oops, what's going on with my, huh, got a little, how did I not notice that before, oh well. I'm just trying to, so I don't know what that was, a little piece of canvas or something was torn and kind of folding up. So I've tried to put a bit of paint underneath there to kind of um, glue that back down. We'll see. It does look a little bit lighter now, but the paint will probably dry a little bit. Um, lighter. Okay, let's do the water here next. So what we're gonna do, basically it's it's a similar thing what we're doing here, but, and again, if you recall, uh, I'm gonna use a smaller brush here uh, with our warm blue, because now we're starting to move towards the foreground. So let's take this color Putting a little bit of gray into it. Oops, maybe a little bit too much white. Now let's just see, this is... Yeah, it needs to be more gray. So let's just, we're gonna need to darken it even more. I mean, when I paint it, it's like, whoa, that's getting too dark. Uh, oh no, too dark. Uh. And then you, then you put it next to you and you're like, oh, not dark enough. Never mind. Sorry. False alarm, everybody. Okay, that's very gray. I think that that looks that looks very close to the original. I'm just gonna put more blue in it. I just I don't want it to be too gray, right? I want it to, it's a happy ocean. 
And this time, I'm also going to just leave that little strip of lighter color there. Yeah, mine has definitely got more blue in it than his. This almost has a purplish quality to it, which is not surprising with a warm blue, because warm blue contains purple, right? Now let's, I wanna look at the texture of his waves and everything. That is nice. You could see <laughs> mine lacks that subtlety um, but we, we're going to go back. Let's go back into it. So, I'm going to wipe that off. Let's put a little bit more white in here. And now, for the first time, using a much my, one of my smaller brushes here. Very subtle, we'll come back. If we wanna make that more, um, oh, I just noticed, uh, you know what? I'm gonna keep that straight line going across. Hmm. I don't have any of those lines on this side, but. It's very subtle. Oops, I think I just put paint on my face, didn't I? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just, let's go back in here. I'm going to take a little bit more blue. And let's just... This is not in his painting at all, but... I don't think it'll be super uncharacteristic. And I think there's a big bush covering this too. So in the bottom right corner, if you don't like how this turns out, just paint a big bush over top. I'm sure Bob Ross would would agree too. That would be 
it's right out of his playbook, you know? If you don't like what you did, put a tree there, a bush, a mountain. Okay. I think that's good. I mean, it's it's definitely way more intense color-wise than his. If we bring these back up side by side. Which long-time viewers will know that I'm much more likely to go brighter and more intense with my colors than be a little bit more uh, light-handed. That is, you know, it's, it's, one might say it's a feature of this particular palette that you're going to end up with more saturated colors, but that's not necessarily the case. It's just if you're, um, the, the, just the less, you know, mixing of colors, uh, the more likely you're going to have more saturated color. Like we can, we can do, we've done paintings that are with great subtlety, um, with this same palette it just you just add more white and black and kind of just tone everything down a little bit okay i think let's uh let's switch to another stage here okay i think basically the background is done well knock on wood because we don't know what's going to happen now that we're now going to focus on the foreground which is the rocks and the the trees which the white pie itself which this painting is called from 1927 so um it is possible that we want to do something to the background uh but we don't know so that's why i'm, I'm always kind of reserved that is the potential to go back and and touch things up so that's where we're at. Let's look at the original. So I think, uh, what should we do next? I'm, I'm gonna mix a brown, or maybe I should do the gray first. So the so I'm just I'll explain my decision making here. So. Um, we have these gray shapes, which are outlined in brown. Now, there's two ways of going about it. One would be to say, let's paint the brown first, and then we'll, we'll kind of fine-tune it with the gray. And the other is to paint with the, the gray and then outline it with the brown. I'm trying to... Which one did I say first? <laughs> um... I, I think probably there's going to be a little bit of both. I'm going to probably paint a little bit with the gray and then go back in with the, the brown and then go back in and touch things up as I did here in the clouds. So I'm going to go for a smallish... Well, let's mix it with a bit of a bigger brush. Um, now to do this... Remember, this is the color that we were using previously. And it's basically our warm yellow and um some little bit i just used some of my brown sorry but my it's my warm yellow with warm red and warm blue but the very little of of those other colors right we want it the more red we put in here the the darker and more orangey this brown will be and the more blue we put in there the much darker we're gonna this is how we're gonna make the brown that we're gonna outline things with but I don't want to go there just yet. I want to do the gray first. So I'm now mixing my black into the gray. 
or into the that brown and I'm mixing white into that brown so I'm making a brownish gray okay now I wonder should I do this all with a bigger brush how are we doing with time three hours yikes Uh, this is, it could get sloppy if I use this bigger brush. So let's do that. <laughs> uh, just to speed things along. There's gonna be a big bush here, so let's not spend too much time in the bottom right corner fidgeting with things. Okay, so I, what I'm doing here is just these little shapes. And obviously he spent a long time in here. Again, don't worry about getting the shapes correct or perfect or even exactly the right color uh, because I think one of the benefits here is if we kind of go back over some of these shapes a few times we'll have a lot of nuance some lighter areas some darker areas
progress even over here now. Again, I'm going very quickly. Um, feel free to take as long as you want in this kind of area. Anything else down here? Okay, let's just zoom back out. All right, first step there, not so bad. Okay. Uh, let's keep on going. I'm going to mix some more of this brown. I'm kind of running out and I want it to be darker. So let's take some a warm yellow, warm red, and warm blue. Mix that up. Now we're getting something... Actually, that's this is my brown. We want a gray, don't we? So let's take that. I'm just going to take the paint that's on my brush as we have. Let's take our uh, black and white. And now we've got a kind of a slightly brownish gray. Uh, well, as we mix this again, we'll do one that's maybe got less brown in there, the one that's got a little bit more black in there, so on and so forth. Oh, and there's Lolly saying hello. Hi, Lolly. Hope you had a happy holiday. Okay. So let's zoom back in. So I'm kind of just painting shapes around. I'm not doing ever going all over and in and around everything. And I'm not really looking at the original here.
and painting a bit over top of that previous brown. So we're getting darker and more and more gray as we go from left to right. We'll modify this. You know, if I was going to spend hours doing all of this here, I would be mixing lots of different grays, putting more blue in here, more red in here, but uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna run out of time if I do that. Um, but let's uh, let it, let's t do let's take a bit more of this black. Put this in here. That's a lot. Put a bit more white. Oops, sorry. So now we have a much darker gray. Let's just go back left to right again. And because this paint's still a little bit wet, um, and you know what? I'm gonna just also, just like what he did, take a little bit of warm blue and mix this warm blue into the gray. That's just because, again, this gray was created with cool blue. And so this is just gonna help pull it forward. Oops. So, the, really the only thing I'm looking at in the original is just to see where the lightest and darkest areas are. I'm not really paying too close attention to the rocks and how closely I'm getting the rocks. And I've, <laughs> where is my tree? The trees, well, we'll find that later on. Who cares, right? We'll, we'll get there. No sense worrying about it until we're, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So I think as 
this will fill up here, less and less of that yellow is going to, um, or the very light, sandy color will show through. Most of it's going to get kind of covered up. Okay. Um, I see he's added a few little bits of, a bit of cool blue into this uh, gray. So let's just do a little bit of that too. I, I like how that, you can see a bit of that popping through in a few places. So I don't think we want much of it. And in an ideal world, this might be stuff that is just done as little touch-ups. look like here. So now we're going to put more brown going in here and event I'm going to start putting the trees in. I think probably what I think I'll do next is I'm going to mix my dark brown or maybe I'll do one last one one more of a, just a slightly darker brown and then I'm gonna go full on dark brown put in my trees because this one's darker yeah I think like just the more little nuance you can have and if we were painting this with oil paint, we could blend all these together. We would have a lot of nuance. With acrylic, unless we're using mediums, like I do have slow dry medium, but I need to go as fast as I can. So I, I need to speed the painting up, not slow it down. it's still not quite it's maybe a little too subtle so i'm just gonna put a little bit more blue in here i just don't have time to putz around too much whoa that's went much darker than expected A bit more red in there. Kind of accidentally, but I like how it looks, so I'm going to run with it. This is probably also very close to the way that uh, they would have painted outside. Now, AJ Casa 
did um, mostly watercolors when he was outside painting, so uh, obviously different approach, but... Different, different medium entirely, but not too far off. I mean, still using warm and cool colors and all that kind of jazz. So now let's go to a darker brown. Let's take our black and blue and red. First, I'm going to start with. Um, larger shapes and then I'm going to go to a smaller paintbrush. And that smaller paintbrush will allow me to refine things. Okay, not, not done yet, but um, let's, um, let's come down here. That tree trunk is going to be, where does it end? I'm just going to get this out here.
All right, so I can use that to kind of help me find some of those details. I'm just gonna move this back up here. We'll do more of that in a moment. Let's just keep on getting that. Where's the other tree? So I can, it's maybe hard to see, uh, but I can, you know, if I tilt this up, I can see the texture of the previous, of those tree branches in here. And which one I've got? Three of them. What did I paint here? This one, I think, is the big one, right? I'll do the other ones later. Let's just get some of this darker area filled in. This is also, you know, if I'm doing this, I don't have to feel so precious about painting out little shapes that I so lovingly applied. I can just kind of, boom, let's put, make that darker. And, and those different colors still stayed there underneath all of this anyway as well, right? Okay, I need to mix more of that paint because I ran out. So let's put some of our warm blue, warm yellow, warm red, but primarily warm blue and warm red. Getting darker and darker. Add some of our black in here. Okay. So now we can do some real refinements in this area.
Ah, this paint. You know, it's been on my palette for a few hours, and it's starting to kind of get a little bit sticky, and um, it's okay. I don't mind that, but I know I do see often people will make a comment about like, how do I stop that from happening? How do I keep my paint from getting all dried up and? The easiest option is just to put less paint on your paper or on your palette when you start and then you'll have less that will seize up on you later on. You just add more as needed. You know, when I teach classes, I often see people just squeeze out big gobs of paint and it's just like, well, okay, that's starting to dry. So I don't know if you're planning on how you're, how thick you're planning on painting, but probably by the time you get down to the end of some of that paint, it's just going to be one big hard blob, or it's not, it won't be hard, but the, the water is, is slowly evaporating. And as it evaporates, it gets thicker, loses its, um, the, the fluidity of it. So what's interesting is you could see in behind here, he's actually added some white to this, uh, or kind of grayed this brown out a little bit. So let's do a bit of that ourselves. Maybe that was a bit too much white, but... The reason why he's doing this... That was a bit too much white. Is to help create a, a difference between the brown of the tree and the brown of the rocks in behind. Getting there, so you could see, like, remember the backgrounds kind of looked a little bit sloppy. wasn't too happy with it, and like, oh, I don't know. Well, as the foreground starts to develop, it's now taking the weight off the background. It's now becoming less obvious. People are gonna look at it less because there's other things to look at, including the trees, which are just about to start developing right there. So, okay, I'm just going to turn my space heater on. My feet are starting to get cold. So, I'm just thinking, what should I do next? I, my, my instinct is to paint the... the branches and then the leaves. Yeah, let's do that. 
Okay. Can I just put... Okay. Uh, maybe. Let's see how much I can get out of this. I was going to say I put white in this paint that I wanted to be my dark color, but... It is what it is. Actually, you know what? I'm just going <laughs> to blow dry this because my hands are... Um, I want to get my... I've just been painting at the bottom down here, and I'm going to be painting up here. That's a... a um, that's tempting fate with my, my sleeve or my palm or elbow or something dragging through the wet. Just, oops, see, there's still a bit of wet paint there. Just sometimes those areas get a little thick. Just be careful. And I like to just to kind of, as I do that, just make sure there's not wet paint here because if I start getting handprints all over this painting, there'll be a lot of uh, muted microphone as I bleep myself. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So this is um, my my paint is just so dry that I'm gonna put a bit of. A little bit of matte medium here. Just add a bit of this into my paint. Let's just take... I don't want to do too much, otherwise this paint's going to get transparent. But this will just kind of waken the paint up a little bit. Add a little bit. As opposed to putting water in here, some people will put water in their paint. Uh, water is just going to dilute it, just like this. But I find when we add water to the paint, it just gets kind of a grainy quality. And I don't like that. I want it to at least be consistent. Another thing that I did was left, when I painted this, I did it deliberately thin so that as I paint, I can continue to expand the thickness of the tree. The worst thing is, is when like the the bottom, you know, the, or the sort of the the top here, these branches get thicker and thicker and thicker, and then the bottom of your tree has to get wider and wider and wider. And how did I? Get, is that? Oh, okay, I thought that was uh, part some brown. I was about to join it up with a tree branch, but.
So this brush, you know, if it gets a little gummy, just clean off that paint, go back in. I just saw a mouse on the opposite side of the room scurry along this baseboard there. Ah! But now I know where you're walking, so I gotcha. So you can see, as I get further down here, the confusion that can happen with, let's say I just painted this tree branch there, and you can see how he's gone and put some kind of grays underneath there to lighten that back up. So I'm gonna do paint some tree branches, and we will do a little bit of outlining there, maybe a bit, but that's just, it's so time consuming that I'll probably paint some gray back into here and then just paint these branches in over top. I'm not too concerned about that though. <laughs> Paula says I might need a cat. Well I'm allergic to cats. That's the only th that's the big problem. Ah Now I'm not spent, I'm not going to worry too much about fine tuning all of this just yet. I mostly just want to be able to get the basic shape of these trees in place so I could start putting some clumps of leaves on here.
you know, if like you get a, a first of all, I could just wipe that away. The spot's still wet if I'm not happy with it, but I can just put a big clump of leaves over top of anything. Okay. Um. Yeah. Let's uh, let's zoom back out. So um, I just want to point out, like again, I'm this. There's areas where it's not quite wide enough. I'm I'm reserving that. I, I want to get this done, and then I'm going to put the the leaves on here, and and then go back and and refine the trunks of these trees. We've just got a big clump of stuff over here as well. Lolly's saying good night. Good night, Lolly. We'll see you at the next. Uh, we'll see you in the new year. Do another panel here. Okay, so what I want to do next is I want to put some of the leaves on these trees. I've just called a foreground pass number three, but really that's where we're, we're talking about the green of this painting, of which there's just maybe 10, 15 percent of the of the painting is got green in there so let's put some green in here we don't we haven't really used green thus far All right that's what we're looking at so this color there's again there's lots of different ways we can go about this uh, I'm gonna start with my warm greens or yeah we want kind of a dark racing green here this is a warm green there is a little bit of cooler greens in here just to give it that bit more saturation um, so but we'll, we'll do that in the subsequent layer we're, I think we're gonna start a little bit darker work our way forward with lighter colors here So to make a, a green is is yellow and blue. Um, I'm gonna make a fairly dark green though to get started. So I'm gonna take our warm yellow and warm blue. I'm also going to take some of our black and put that in there. Again, if you've gone, if your background is too um, too dark, you may even need to add a little bit of actual black into this mixture. But you might want to just see how it looks first before you do anything rash. You know, and I'll, I'll 
say that you know doing this kind of thing feels like whoa I'm gonna jump into the to the deep end because I'm painting right over top of my background and that can feel like you know I've, I'm kind of happy with the background I don't now we're gonna throw some trees on in front of it I don't know Michael so the if you're really concerned about that the best course of action is to blow dry everything make sure it's bone dry maybe go away for go get some dinner come back and then um, uh, that way if you do make him a quote-unquote mistake you can then just take a cloth get a little bit of water on it and really quickly wipe it away if you're afraid that you might um, uh, go too far So now I've got a relatively small brush here. Now notice it's a little bit transparent, that's okay. There's no white in here. White would make this much more opaque, and, and black out of the tube would also be much more opaque. But I don't want it to be just totally black. I, in fact, I don't mind a little bit of transparency. Again, I'm just eyeballing this. Don't worry about uh, perfection. It's the enemy of good. Another um, thing that, that is kind of one thing you want to, to do is it's, it's very nice when these kind of overlap elements in the background. Like, let's say these clouds moving forward. If, you, if you're like, oh, I love how I did the clouds. I got to keep them so precious. I don't want them kind of overlapping. Well, and I want to kind of preserve these great parts what that does is it can create that little confusion as to like maybe the clouds are in front or behind if this is litter if this tree is in front of your background it is going to it's going to block out the background right so you have to block out the background which i know can be kind of tough because sometimes we want to spend all that time developing it and to just cover it up feels sort of like wasted time it's not wasted time. First of all, some of that might even show through, and it's it is the really the key to to giving this painting depth.
All right, so this mountain, remember I spent time here developing that, and here I am just about to paint right over top of it. Oh, what have I done? All that beautiful work with the glazing fluid. It's part of the process. So we've got this tree that sort of just disappears partly behind the, this little ridge. Right, and I can put little, you know, um, clumps of, of leaves that don't even have, that aren't connected to the tree yet, <laughs> right? I want to make sure that uh, I connect it later on, so it's not, unless it's like a, a leaf that's just flying away. Like this area right down here. Okay, let's add some more yellow to this mixture. I'm just going to keep it right on my brush and just paint this area in real quick. So remember I said if you don't like what you've done with the waves, just fill it up with bushes.
Okay, we'll define that more in a little bit here. Just get that in place. And you know, now that I've got this paint on my brush, uh, I'm just wondering, maybe I'll just go in here. Some of this is already kind of dry. Let's zoom back in. Right, and all of a sudden it starts coming together, right? Where it's, it seemed for maybe far too long, like things weren't happening. And here all of a sudden, you know, it's starting to come together. You know, one little thing that I think is, is brilliant about what he's doing, and I'll just kind of show you, is there are parts where there's slight confusion as to, like, is this area right here a, a part of the tree or not? And I think, you know, generally as a artist, we want to clarify things and make things maybe more um, just, just immediately understandable by the viewer. But sometimes it's having that little bit of nuance is good because not everything that you see is just immediately clear. Like, there's sometimes there's that little, like, you have to kind of look a little bit closer. You're like, oh, no, that's part of the tree, right? It draws you into the painting. That's a good thing. Okay, let's um, blow dry this, and then I'm going to do more. I'm going to go back, darken a little bit more in a few places, and then start lightening it. Okay. So, you know, I'm just going to go right in with my black. Um, let's take my black and just a little bit of, of green. So we have a green dominant black.
So again, putting some of this black without any white whatsoever right up in the front is going to pull it forward. And there won't be any mistake as to what is in the foreground, what's in the background. It might disappear a little bit at times into the surrounding landscape. And as I said, we might have to look in a little bit closer as a viewer to see. really going dark with this black down here is, is essential. To the point where I'm just going to take some actual just black that I have on my palette, not from the tube, but just, oops, let's go further down. I'm going to take a um, bit of this black and just go in with a little bit of my darker green again.
Okay. Things are coming along. I'm liking how this works. Really, we've gone pretty dark. I mean, we literally used our darkest green, which is basically, I, I it was basically black. There was a little bit, so in some places actually I did just use black. Uh, so I think I'm gonna lighten things up now. So I'm gonna take my uh, cool yellow. And a little bit of, oops, a little bit of this um, darker red. And you know what? I'm going to take just a little bit of white. I'm going to, the reason I'm adding white in here is it's going to, I've because I've painted something kind of dark underneath, I'm a little afraid that I'm going to have to do layer after layer after layer of this warm yellow. This is just going to speed this process up a bit. I'm going to have to paint over some of it. Oh, you can see how bright that appears. So as I said, this is definitely way lighter than I want to use, but maybe I'll keep a little bit of it. I kind of like I kind of like that brightness.
Okay, and then down here, this is probably where some of this will actually stay. Oops. Okay, and maybe even it can go a little bit right, or take a bit more white. A little, I went a little too far. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Pascal says, This is not an easy one, as he said at the start. Well, I don't know. It depends. I mean, I don't feel like I'm doing anything overly complicated. It just takes some time and patience, right? So now I'm gonna I'm gonna pull back down. Let's get the let's let's narrow in the colors. So next step, I'm going to take a little bit of my cool yellow. I'm not going to need much of it, but I'm going to take that. Let's see. Let's, let's just do a little bit of a comparison. We'll take our cool blue, warm blue, sorry, and cool yellow. So we still get a pretty... Um, desaturated color. So let's take our cool yellow and cool blue. We'll 
We'll mix this together. Don't have a lot of black left. Take a little bit of black. Oops, not too much white. Because we're basically mixing it, making a bit of a gray. And then we're just going to put color back into it. And while that might not seem like too bright of a color, compared to the colors that are there already, that's bright enough. There might have been a bit too much white in there. So I don't have to, I don't want to have to mix more black. I hate it. You know when you're right near the end and you're just like, I just want to finish this up. Okay, so let's mix a bit more black. Let's take our warm red, cool blue, and cool yellow. Mix our black up. this back in here so we just get a bit of a deeper color just less white <laughs> and we're back where we started Ugh. too much white in there Okay, let's just do this again. Let's just do this elsewhere. Okay. I'm trying to use up all the extra paint. And by using up the extra paint, I'm mixing in some white accidentally that I don't really want there. Probably, well, I was hoping this would be. Let's take a bit of warm yellow, mix that in there. That's what we needed. So it's the cool blue and warm yellow, I think, is, is what we want. Give it a little bit of that slightly grassier quality. Yeah, there we go. So it's my cool blue and warm yellow. Now you, I could have kept a lot of that yellow or that green that I had there previously. It's not hurting anybody, but uh, I don't know, maybe even a little bit of it will come back.
right. Uh, let's um, now just refine this with a little bit more black. Let's go back in. A little bit back and forth. Back and forth. So now I'm just putting, this has got a little bit of green in this black, not quite as black as the black black that I put there earlier. And just want to just refine it and create more shapes in here. So it's not just blobs of paint. There's it looks like I've gone in and I've been looking carefully at things. Pascal's painting the one Miro. That's great. I don't know if it's the same one we did, but we did a Miro a few years ago, one of the first ones we did. Really fun painter. I've also visited the one Miro Foundation and Museum. Oh, I'm trying to think, where was that? <laughs> uh, was that... Maybe was that in... Well, I don't know. Somewhere in Spain. I know I've been there. I just can't remember where... Is it Santiago de Compostela? I don't think so. Is it Madrid? Must be Madrid. I bet you that's where it is. Okay. I mean, we're, we're pretty close. I mean, I've obviously, I'm hurrying along, and I could do a lot more there. I think at this stage... Pascal says, I know Dali's got a particularly great museum in Spain one day. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, um, Dali has a few museums scattered around the world. There's, uh, I think, a couple in Spain, I think one in France, one in Fort Lauderdale, or the, somewhere near the Florida Keys down there, that I think is got a lot of prints and things on display. I'm not sure how... I think there's some sculptures of his. Okay. So, let's do the tree. Our, our warm yellow. Our warm red. Sorry. Warm yellow, warm red. 
We got a warm orange. And we need more warm blue. So we're mixing up a real dark, dark brown, right? I mean, that's almost as dark as our our black itself. I mean, it's darker than any other brown I've put down there thus far. Um, I'm just going to use this. I, I could put a little bit of black in there, but I think, I think I've got it black enough. See, this brush is has been around for a while. It's gotten. Let me see if I got uh, a newer fine brush here that I can. So I think it's like the the these little branches kind of going all over the place is what can make this painting really successful. We did a tree. Oh, was it the J. H. McDonald? Whereas right at the end, I kind of got a little bit hurried and sloppy. And when I did that, I um, I regretted not using a smaller brush like this. That I just sort of tried to get it done quickly. And obviously we want the majority of these branches to be going to the right here. There's a few that aren't.
don't mind if it kind of trails off and kind of disappears, right? That's kind of how our eyes would see it anyway. I don't usually see every single detail. So I notice I haven't widened the trunk of the tree yet. I'm going to wait until that'll be one of the very last things that I do. I, you know, I guess I'm not, I should look at the, <laughs> the original a little bit more. I'm just sort of having fun doing my thing here, but, uh. Now I'm going to start um, painting the tree trunk here. And it needs to be wider than any of those branches. So I want to pay close attention that the that you know if it goes behind here that it's gonna pop out in the same direction as not going this way bump 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 back and forth that it's consistent. I just need to uh, join that up. There we go. Let's 
go to the tree on the right now. I'm just out of curiosity, um, Paula did mention something about the audio being a little bit, uh, the fan being really loud. So I was playing with some of the, the audio. Does it sound worse than it has in previous episodes? Let me know in the comments there that maybe I accidentally did something that I shouldn't have done there, so... Pascal says, it seems to be the same as usual. Okay, well, that's good. Thanks, Pascal, for your feedback. I really do appreciate that. And hopefully, the same as usual is, is okay and not terrible. Um... Now there are all those, I might, do, should I want to do that other tree? Maybe I will, I'm just, I do worry sometimes about just over complicating it with, you know, just because the, the those details are there in the original doesn't mean I want to do them all.
So, let's get this other tree in here. Don't have a lot of room to play in here. do that other tree that's right here. I always wonder to myself, like, if I do it, does that make people feel like they are also obligated to do it? Or by not doing it, does that give people the sense of permission that they don't need to do it themselves? do I want to do more a darker brown So what I'm doing now is I'm looking at both of them side by side and I'm squinting my eyes, trying to see, you know, what is the darker areas, what are the lighter areas, and specifically I'm painting darker, so I'm looking for what needs, with my darkest dark, what are those shapes in there? All right, so I see something in here.
Okay, I think I'm just about ready to call it quits. So in fact, let's keep that paint on my brush there. Okay, I think it's time to do some finishing touches and to wrap up. So it's just sort of looking at little details, thinking what little details need to be finessed here and there. Um, let's look at both of these paintings side by side. Oops, we want that. I think what I need, I mean, I could do a lot of work in here. Uh, I wanted a little bit more gray though. So let's, let's take our white. Let's take this. Remember there was a bit of yellow in there. Ooh, is that too much? So this also is starting to take out some of that the intensity of that that beachy, sandy, khaki, yellow, whatever you want to call it. That was that's working really nice. I like that. So what he would have done is spent probably a lot of time at this stage of the painting. This would have probably been one of the most, not time consuming, but just places where he might have had a lot of fun just kind of going in here. Because, you know, the, ref the finishing touches is often... You know, one of the funnest, I think, one of the most entertaining parts of a painting. It's always kind of at the end of these episodes where they just sort of... I'm in a bit of a hurry, trying to wrap it up. And Just a little bit more white. And you know what? I'm going to go to a small brush again.
Ah, there's Temperus says, gosh, what's happening right now? I'm new to the stream. Hi. <laughs> Oh, the, the, the time stopped working. I was wondering, what's going on here? Whoa, it's longer than I thought. I, I didn't realize I was, I've been here. Pfft. See, time flies when you're painting. My goodness, I, I'm like looking at it like, ah, oh, we're only three hours and 45 minutes in. And I think that was like two hours ago. <laughs> uh, ah, that's, I'm telling you, if I had a dollar for every time that's happened to me, when I've been painting. So just these little bits of white in here, little highlights. It's, well, it's not white. I'm, I'm mixing a little bit of gray into it. It's not just pure white, but And if you wanted, you could go back and tidy it up with even more dark brown. Sometimes just a few of these little lines here and there oh, go a long way to convincing people that there's a lot of detail there. You don't need to spend hours and hours and hours doing detail if you've got a few lines that suggest... Okay, I think. Can I walk away? I think I can walk away. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for painting along with me. It's time to take a look, compare them side by side, see how they did. If you're joining us for the first time, like our friend Temperus, please consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell so you know when the future videos are going to be streaming live. And there's going to be a whole bunch. We're starting the whole new season coming in January, so you don't want to miss anything. Uh, I also want to just remind you of our Facebook page. If you haven't yet joined the Facebook page, go there right now. There's a link in the description. Um, and upload a version of your painting. Maybe you were painting AJ Casal's painting today or two years from now. Or you've been working on something else while I've been painting here and while other people have been painting along with me. That's okay. You don't need to be doing exactly what we're doing in class. In fact, probably the majority of people are doing other things. And once a month, I go through that group, cull all the great material from there, and give people feedback. Free feedback from a professional artist who teaches at uh, Canada's best university. I think I would say so. Um, and uh, and I'm happy to do so because I want to foster more and more creativity in our world, especially in these dark times. The more people who are spending their time painting and doing something creative with their lives, I think would do the world a good service. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation through PayPal, you can use the super chat function here within YouTube. If you want to send a check or e-transfer, contact me through the Facebook group or my website. All those links are in the description below. Da -da 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 -da. Um, let's see, how did we do? You tell me. There's our finished painting. Um, again, there's as always, we could continue and continue and continue painting. You know, and as I look at it, I feel like I could do some stuff here, but 
you know what it's time to call it a day we've been painting for a long time as i said five hours now so um you know i'm, I'm happy with the way this turned out there's a lot of detail in here uh, i don't think it's a, that really that complex of a painting it's just a time consuming painting so if you got the time i think you can do this one let's zoom in Let's start in the top left corner and just look at that. You know, I'm not super happy with the way these clouds turned out. You know, as, as I mentioned earlier, and then I went back and put a little bit of warm yellow back in there. Um, I think it's the, the yellowish quality of this painting is probably more likely to be the varnish that has yellowed over time as opposed to an actual yellow tint or you know hue that's been that is in all the paints i i'm much more likely to believe that it's uh, the varnish having said that you know having put a little bit of that yellow just sort of give it a little bit like the warm summer um, light on the lake um, so i think it, it works um, obviously, you know, I, when I painted this, I lost a lot of those shapes, which is just par for the course and going a little bit fast. I mean, he drew all of these, you know, he's painting on a canvas that's four times the size of this. So he drew out all of those different shapes and individually painted them. I just did a big blue uh, background and then painted over top of them and did it quickly. I could if I wanted to, and I still got more of this blue still wet and ready to use if i wanted i could go around and tidy all of that up if i wanted to but you know it's like at some point you just got to say call it a day and move on right let's look at down here on the bottom left of the actually you know let's go to the top right here stay with the sky since we're talking about the sky you can see again in in this painting on the on my version the sky has got more of a baby blue quality it's a little bit cooler whereas his has again more of that yellow tint or hue to it uh, than mine um, i would have liked to have done this with a little bit more of a transparent layer so my warm yellow could come through and if I wanted, I could do a yellow, warm yellow wash with a very like thin glaze, and that would it would look instantly exactly the same. But you know, I don't mind mine as it's turned out already. So, uh, ooh, I do notice that there is a tree branch floating in space. One second here. I know I said I was done, but or there was a. A clump of trees here. Okay, I think that's. <laughs> there we go. I didn't want it to be like, what is it floating off into space? Um, yeah. How about let's let's go bottom right then. Pascal, you ask a great question. How do we know that the original is how it looks? Uh, is it close to the real colors or not? That's the age-old question. How well documented were these paintings? Um, I'm happy with these colors. Again, I, I, if I was to take more time, I would do this much more carefully. This is pretty sloppy stuff down here, but it's okay. Just, And I probably would have lightened up because uh, there is light obviously hitting this area so it makes sense for this to be brighter it's just you know we're out of time for today uh i would also have put in more cooler grays in here we got this is more of a kind of a reddish rose gray that is not not what he's done there really well i guess there's a bit of it down here um but, you know, again, there's only so much time in life, right? Let's look at the bottom down here. You can see how much more uh, intense my uh, yellows are, that sandy color. 
I don't mind it like that. In fact, I think it looks, my painting looks good in person on its own, but I'm just, it is different, right? And you know, you saw how quickly I painted that. So there's just, um, you know, you just gotta say how much, is, what is your time worth? <laughs> Down here, I, I'm pretty happy, I, you know, this is, you, we can see this beautiful patterning on the rocks that he clearly spent a lot of time observing closely. Mine is just sort of a haphazard, you know, bunch of lines and dots that aren't really kind of really describing this form in quite the same way. And that's typical of many of the paintings that we do in class where I'm just, I'm more concerned that people get to know the, how to actually paint the painting than worry so much about doing all the structural stuff. I guess that's maybe something I could think about for future episodes, and, but that just requires a lot more time and much more careful observation. Um, it would have been nice to have put a few little lines there in the far trees with a little bit of a that same blue, but just a little, you know, basically that this blue here and just some vertical lines I think would have worked well. Let's finish off with our tree. Let's go to this tree here, and then we'll end with the white pine itself. So, I think that's okay. It it's tended. It looks a little more sprawling than the uh, the one on the left, the original, maybe. I do like, his really has like a, you know, it's, you, we feel a bit more of the intensity of the wind blowing through than mine, I, I would say. He really captured these diagonals in his painting. He's got, you know, in the way that he painted the trees, which is what I would focus on a little bit more if I was to do this. And then let's wrap up with our big tree here you can see the layering of shapes is not we don't really have that so much in mind just because of the speed um, but it would have been nice had I kind of done kind of what I did with the with these shapes in the clouds had I done that in the trees but you know it's again let's just look down here a lot of differences in the way that his in, in and I painted that just because of how quickly I was working. And, you know, I would have, I could really spend more time fixing this. You can really see he's done a good job of adding those grays in behind here to differentiate between branches and the, and the rocks. But, you know, what are you gonna do, right? Okay. Thank you everyone for painting along with me. Another great episode in the books. This takes us to the end of 2023 and another year of master study painting episodes. I look forward to seeing you guys in 2020, 2023. I would also say 2024. It is 2023 next year. It, you know, it's one of those things that the, I, at the end of the year, everything just gets a little bit you know, it's, it's been a long year. <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening. I wish you all a safe and merry, happy New Year's. Uh, and uh, go out and have some fun. Just be careful about driving. Get a designated driver. Take a cab or walk. Take transit. I'd love to see all of you back here again in the New Year safe and sound. Until then, we'll see you guys all in a future episode. I love you, and I'm blessed to have this incredible community of, of artists. We'll see you again. Good night, everybody. <laughs>